Aloha mai kako. Good morning. This is the July 22nd, 2020 Land Use Commission meeting and is being held using interactive conference technology linking video conference participants and other interested individuals from the public via the Zoom internet conferencing program. We're doing this in order to comply with state and county official operational directives during the current pandemic. Members of the public are viewing the meeting via the Zoom webinar platform. For all meeting participants, I would like to stress for everyone the importance of speaking slowly, clearly, and directly into your microphone. And also before speaking, please state your name and identify yourself for the record. Please also be aware for all meeting participants that these meetings are being recorded on the digital record of the Zoom meeting. Your continued participation is your implied consent to be part of the public record of this event. And if you do not wish to be part of the public record, you should exit the meeting. The Zoom conferencing technology allows the parties and each participating commissioner individual remote access to the meeting proceedings via their personal digital devices. Please note that due to matters entirely outside of our control, occasional disruptions to connectivity may occur for one or more members of the meeting at any given time. If such disruptions occur, please let us know and please be patient as we try to resolve the audiovisual signals to effectively conduct business during the pandemic. My name is Jonathan Lee K.K. Scheuer and I serve as the Land Use Commission Chair. Along with me are Commissioners Axon, Chang, Okuda, and Wong, the LUC Executive Officer Daniel Oradenker, LUC Chief Planner Scott Derrickson, the LUC's Deputy Attorney General Julie Chena, and our court reporter Gene McManus, as well as um, Ed, Edmund, or excuse me, as well as Riley Hakoda, we are all on Oahu. Commissioner Cabral is on Hawaii Island, Commissioner Ohigashi is on Maui, and Commissioner Giovanni is on Kauai. We ha currently have eight seated commissioners of nine possible. Our first order of business is the adoption of the June 24th through 25th, 20, 25th 2020 minutes. Are there any corrections or comments on the minutes from the commissioners? Seeing none, is there a motion to adopt the June 24th and 25th minutes? This is Nancy. I make a motion to adopt both sets of minutes. Uh, we're going to do them one by one, unfortunately, just for clarity of procedure. Um, June 24th. Uh, make a motion. The 24th and 25th, you mean? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. A motion's been made by Commissioner Cabral. Is there a second? Hold on. This is Arnold. Commissioner. I second. Okay. It's been motions been made by Commissioner Cabral and seconded by Commissioner Wong. Is there any discussion? Um, seeing none, um, Mr. Ordenker, please do a roll call vote of the commission. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Cabral. Yes. Commissioner Wong. Yes. Commissioner Okuda. Yes. Commissioner Axon. Present. Is that a vote in favor of the minutes, Commissioner Axon? Aye. Thank you. <laughs> um, Commissioner Chang. Yes. Commissioner Giovanni. Abstain. Um, who am I missing? Um, Ohigashi. Commissioner Ohigashi. Aye. Chair Scheuer. Aye. Uh, the minutes are adopted unanimously. unanimously. Uh, with one abstention. One abstention, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, we now will take up the matter of approving the July 8th and 9th, 2020 minutes. Is there a discussion or a corrections on the minutes? He's driving it up here. If not, I'll have a I'll take a motion to adopt. I'll move to adopt. Moved by Co Commissioner Cabral. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Ohigashi. Is there any discussion on the motion? If not, Mr. Ordenker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Cabral. Yes. Commissioner Ohigashi. Yes. 
Commissioner Giovanni. Aye. Commissioner Chang. Yes. Commissioner Axon. Aye. Commissioner Okuda. Yes. Commissioner Wong. Aye. Chair Scheuer. Aye. Uh, the motion is adopted unanimously. Great, thank you very much. And now Mr. Ordenko, our next agenda item is the updating meeting schedule. Will you walk us through that please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, tomorrow we will again be meeting by Zoom uh, to hear the U of N Bencourt matter and to complete DR 2069-70 from uh, on the Big Island via Zoom. And we will also we also have time scheduled for any matters that are not completed with the um, A17 804 Hawaii Memorial Park matter. Um, on August 12th, we are scheduled to uh, continue proceedings on the Central Maui landfill matter and adopt the order. Um, there is also, if that meeting is held via Zoom, there will also be time for Hawaii Memorial Park matters if necessary. Um, August 13th is open uh, unless there's Hawaii Memorial Park matters that uh, need to be completed. August 26th, um, we're currently scheduled to be live on Maui um, for, a Hano, for the Hano Hano motion. And on August 27th, we are scheduled to be live on Kauai, um, for, uh, I mean on uh, Maui for the Kihei High School matter. Um, those meetings may change to Zoom meetings depending on circumstances. On Sept in September, we were scheduled to be on Maui for the Sea Brewer bifurcation on September 9th and on September 10th. Continuation of the Sea Brewer bif bifurcation matter on Maui and the Hano Hano motion to uh, amend. <clears throat> on September 23rd, um, we have set aside for any closing matters on the Hawaii Memorial Park issue. On September 24th, um, we will be on Oahu for the Halekua development motions. And on October 7th and 8th, we currently have open due to changes uh, as a result of um, the failure of HB 2035 not to pass, failing to pass. Um, our calendar is open until October 22nd when we will be on the Big Island and Hilo for the Newton Family Matter and the Hawaii Island Land Trust motion to amend. On November 4th, um, we will be on Oahu for Halekua Development. Uh, November 5th is open. November 18th, we will be on Maui for the Wound Hotel Matter. Um, and then uh, November 19th is open. December 2nd, we will be on Maui for Palamo and I. Um, on December 3rd, we will be hearing the Barry Trust matter. On December 16th, we have set aside for the Big Island for the church matter. And December 17th, the Barry Trust matter adoption of order. That takes us through the end of the calendar year. Great, thank you, Mr. Ordenker. Commissioners, are there any questions for Dan? Commissioners? No? Okay. Seeing none. Our next agenda item is our continued hearing and action meeting on docket number A17804, Hawaiian Memorial Life Plan Limited, to consider a petition to amend the conservation land use district boundary into the urban land use district for approximately 53.449 acres of land at Kaneohe, Island of Oahu, State of Hawaii, TMK 1-4-5-003, portion of lot one. Will the parties for docket number A17804 please identify themselves for the record and you may need to unmute yourself. Good morning, Chair Scheuer, members of the commission. My name is Ben Matsubara, and along with Curtis Tabata, we represent the Petitioner Hawaiian Memorial Life Plan Limited. Good morning. 
Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Dwayne Peng, Deputy Corporation Counsel on behalf of the City and County of Honolulu. Thank you, Mr. Peng. Good morning, Chair, Deputy Attorney General Don Apuna on behalf of the State Office of Planning. Here with me is Roddy Funakoshi and Lorraine Maki. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is Grant Yoshimori. Uh, with me is Rich McCready, and we are intervenors pro se. Thank you, Mr. Yoshimori. Let me now update the record. On June 24th, 2020, the commission met using the same Zoom technology for an action meeting on this docket to consider the petition to amend the conservation land use district boundary into the urban land use district. The petitioner and the county concluded their respective presentations on the docket at that meeting. From June 24th through today, the commission has received public comments via email and written correspondence on this matter, which have been made part of the record. On July 14th, 2020, the commission mailed our July 22nd and 23rd, 2020 notice of agenda to the parties and to our statewide Oahu and Hawaii regular and email mailing lists. Let me run over our procedures for today. First, I will recognize written public testimony that has been submitted in this matter, identifying the person or organization who has submitted the testimony. I will do so with the assistance of our chief clerk, Riley Hakoda. Second, and I wanna make a comment about oral testimony. Um, after all public testimony had been heard on June 8th, 2020, I made it clear to all parties and members of the public that because we were entering the formal um, quasi-judicial portion of these proceedings, that public testimony had been closed in order to move forward with the evidentiary portion of the docket. Because of that, there wasn't going to be any further oral public testimony received on this matter. Um, in our attempts to um, go, frankly, above and beyond what some other state and county boards and commissions have done, we have been allowing public testimony and the registration to provide testimony available via Zoom. Be in those attempts, it might have appeared to some people as they registered to attend this meeting that they had the option to give testimony on this matter today. People have the option to submit written testimony to the commission, but there will be no oral testimony received on this matter from the general public today. However, when we schedule this matter for decision making, we will allow further public testimony on that day for this matter. Sorry for any confusion that this may have caused to any members of the public as you registered to attend this meeting, but had not been familiar with our proceedings to this point. Finally, after the acknowledgement of any written testimony, the petitioner, um, the State Office of Planning, and then the intervener, Huyo Pikoi Loa, will make their presentations. From time to time, I will be calling for recesses. And in addition, I will note for the parties that we will lose one of our commissioners at 3 o'clock. So our proceedings today will end at 3 p.m. The same is actually going to be true for our proceedings tomorrow. Are there any questions on our procedures today from the party, starting with the petitioner? No questions. Uh, no questions from the city. No questions from the state. Intervener has no questions, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Hakoda, do you have a list of the individuals and organizations who have provided written testimony since the last hearing till today? Uh, Mr. Chair, there was such a flurry of last minute submittals to register for the meeting. I've been unable to keep up with uh, uh, tracking everyone's uh, contributions. I will be posting them to the website uh, for public review. I, okay. I don't have a report for you. Assembly. Thank you. So all the parties and the commissioners are advised that um, as the website is updated, all written testimony received by the commission will be posted to the website and will be considered part of the record on this matter. Any questions on that? No. Thank you very much, Mr. Hokoda, and we know how hard you and all the staff have been meeting, working during these difficult times. With that, Ms. Apuna, are you ready to proceed? Yes, Chair, thank you. Great. Uh, the Office of Planning will call our first witness, Cynthia King. She's okay. an attendee. Okay, I will admit her in. Yeah. Um, Wait, hold on. Chair, I apologize. Yes. Um, 
I'm going to have to switch gears here. Can we actually okay. have um, Rodney Funagoshi go first? Uh, sure. Um, okay. Um, Cynthia, I'm sorry I let you into the meeting and I'm removing you now. And if I'm somehow kicking you out of the meeting, please log back on. Um, oh, yeah, shoot. Um, Mr. Funakoshi, is that who you said? Yes. Oh, but he's with you physically. Oh, he, yes, he's here with me. So I'll just turn the, the computer towards him when he starts to speak. Great. I will swear. I haven't actually seen Mr. Funakoshi since March. Do you look the same? <laughs> Do you have your, you don't have COVID bushy hair. You've been sneaking out for haircuts. Morning. Good morning. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give us the truth? Yes. Okay. Please proceed, Ms. Apuna. All right. Um, Mr. Funakoshi, can you please provide us uh, some background as far as your education and professional experience? Oh, okay. <clears throat> I have a master's in urban and regional planning from the University of Hawaii. And I have 30 plus years of uh, professional planning experience at the state and as a private planning consultant. And I've been um, planning program administrator for the state office of planning land use division uh, for the past uh, nine years. I Chair OP requests that Mr. Funakoshi be qualified as an expert in land use planning. Any objections from the parties? No objections. County. Uh, no objections. Intervener has no objections. Commissioners. Okay, so admitted. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Funakoshi, can you please summarize your testimony? Okay, thank you. And good morning, Chair and Commissioners. The Office of Planning recommends approval of Hawaiian Memorial Life Plan's request to reclassify approximately 53 acres from the State Conservation District to the Urban District subject to conditions. Regarding areas of state concern, the black line or rainbow eye Hawaiian damselfly is an endangered invertebrate species located within the petition area. OP is concerned that the habitat for the endangered Hawaiian damselfly be properly managed and maintained. A witness from the Department of Land and Natural Resources will elaborate on this issue. Regarding archeological and historical resources, uh, the State Historic Preservation Division in April 2019 approved the archeological inventory survey. Petitioner must submit a data recovery plan, preservation plan, and an archeological monitoring plan prior to permitting processes. Regarding cultural resources, OP acknowledges the establishment of a 14.5 acre cultural preserve within the petition area. OP also acknowledges uh, a conservation easement proposed by the petitioner on 156 acre portion of the property, which would remain within the conservation district. Regarding transportation, uh, we have received an updated Department of Transportation letter of February 12th that rescinds a previous recommendation for participation in a traffic signal uh, development as no longer being necessary uh, since the contribution is determined to be negligible by the state DOT. Uh, the Department of Health's wastewater branch uh, commented that the project should not have any impacts on individual wastewater systems. Okay, regarding applicable standards, OP finds that the property meets the standards set forth in 
Hawaii administrative rules for determining state urban district boundaries in that the project is adjacent to existing urban development. Basic services are adequate for the proposed cemetery expansion in the general area. <clears throat> OP recommends approval of the petition area subject to the petitioner's commitments to avoid, minimize, or mitigate project impacts as represented herein and in this proceeding and the imposition of the following conditions in addition to the standard conditions of the commission. So OP recommends 11 conditions, which I will summarize here. One, stormwater management and drainage. Petitioners shall implement applicable best management practices to minimize infiltration and runoff from construction and vehicle operations reduce or eliminate the potential for soil erosion and groundwater pollution, and formulate dust control measures to be, to be implemented during and after the development process in accordance with Department of Health guidelines and city ordinances and rules. Two, air quality monitoring. Petitioners shall participate in an air quality monitoring program as required by the State Department of Health. Uh, condition three has been deleted uh, per previous uh, indication from Department of Transportation. Condition four, establish gathering and access rights that petitioners shall preserve any established gathering and access rights of Native Hawaiians who have customarily and traditionally used the petition area to exercise subsistence, cultural, and religious practice or for access to other areas. Five, previously unidentified burials and archeological historic sites um, that should any be encountered, all work shall cease, the State Historic Preservation Division contacted and construction act activity halted until appropriate mitigation measures approved by the State Historic Preservation Division have been implemented. Six, that the petitioners shall establish the cultural preserve in conjunction with an appropriate Native Hawaiian group. Seven, endangered species. Uh, there are 13 conditions uh, to properly manage and maintain the habitat for the endangered Hawaiian damselfly. Eight, to avoid potential impacts to the Hawaiian hoary bat, limitations on the clearing of dense vegetation shall, uh, shall be imposed. Nine, conservation easement, that the petitioners shall establish a conservation easement and file this with the Bureau of Conveyances for the 156.5 acre portion of the parcel. 10, development timetable. Petitioners shall provide the commission with a development timetable prior to obtaining draining permits from the city. 11, compliance with representations that the petition area shall be developed in substantial compliance with representations made to the commission. And 12, infrastructure deadline, that petitioners shall complete construction of the proposed backbone infrastructure, which consists of the primary roadways and access points, internal roadways and offsite water and electrical system improvements, and drainage and other utility system improvements within 10 years from the date of the decision and order approving the petition. So that summarizes um, our testimony and the recommended conditions from the Office of Planning. Um, Mr. Funakoshi is now available for uh, cross-examination. Thank you. Um, starting with the petitioner, Mr. Matsubara. Yes, Chair Shire. The petitioner has no questions of Mr. Funakoshi. Thank you. County, Mr. Pang. Uh, the city has no questions for this witness. Thank you. Okay. Intervener, Mr. Yoshimori. Thank you. Um, Mr. Funakoshi, uh, I have just a few questions. Um, in OP's testimony regarding the Hawaiian damselfly, it states that the petitioner can proceed given mitigations, including uh, herringbone drains, uh, well monitoring gauges, supplemental water lines to the habitat, and small sticks near the rivers 
and also doing continuous inspections. Um, is that correct? Uh, yes, I believe so. We have uh, listed 13 conditions. Okay. Um, in the letter from the Fish and Wildlife Services to the Office of Planning, it's um, OP's Exhibit 6, uh, the Fish and Wildlife recommended, quote, coordination with the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program in order to establish a habitat restoration and conservation program for the damselflies habitat, unquote. But in OP's testimony, it states, quote, in a verbal discussion with the State Department of Land and Natural Resources Division of Forestry and Wildlife, they indicated that a habitat restoration and conservation plan with the USFWS would only be necessary if the proposed mitigation measures as detailed below are not sufficient to maintain and manage the habitat. Um, was the Fish and Wildlife brought in to make that determination? Uh, no. Okay. We uh, consulted with the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Thank you. The condition does provide that additional mitigation measures uh, may be imposed in consultation uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service. But that's only if the um, DLNR determines that it's necessary. Uh, bring in yes. the Fish and Wildlife Service. Yeah, uh, okay, I'm not exactly sure who would determine uh, that. It's probably, yeah, I'm not sure exactly who would determine that. You may wanna, I would like to um, defer questions on vehicular mitigation to our DLNR witness, Ms. King, who is following my testimony here. Okay, thank you. Um, on page three of OP's witness testimony, or written testimony, excuse me, it also states that the Fish and Wildlife letter, quote, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service also indicated that they had strong concerns regarding impacts to the ho endangered Hawaiian damselfly habitat. Um, is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. In the Fish and Wildlife's letter, they state, quote, we retain concerns that extend and depth of the slope grading, trenching, and filling up slope of the endangered damselfly habitat at this site has the potential to alter the local hydrology, potentially reducing or eliminating the outflow from the small spring on which the damselfly depends, unquote. Um, do, do you recall that? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, the Fish and Wildlife letter, it, it was a response to OP's request for comments on the final EIS, um, which, and that EIS also included all of the discussions of the herringbone, the supplemental water line, and the well monitoring. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. Thank you. Um, you know, I've spoken to the Fish and Wildlife's Deputy Field Supervisor, Koob, and Dan Polhemis, and both say that they haven't reviewed the mitigations with the state. Um, has OP discussed the eight dam supply mitigations with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Yeah, thank you. Um, and regarding the cultural preserve, um, OP's testimony says, quote, the petitioner shall work with the community and the Ko'olau Poco Hawaiian Civic Club in order to establish a preservation and working plan for the cultural preserve in perpetuity, unquote. Um, do you envision the preservation and working plan being completed and presented to the LUC prior to the closure of the LUC proceedings for this district boundary amendment? I'm not aware of a specific timetable for before the closing of this proceeding. I would imagine it may take a while. So, so you're saying it's probably be after the LUC has to render a decision? I would think so. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Funakoshi. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Yoshimori. Uh, commissioners, questions for the witness? Commissioner Wong. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Funakoshi. Um, one of the major, one of the questions I have was dealing with the rockfall mitigation issues are you, can you speak about that issue or not? Uh, not as an expert, but 
I am aware of uh, the testimony presented by Mr. Lim, I believe. Yes. So in your past experiences, if I may use that, um, do you believe that the mitigation that they suggested would be enough for the area? Yeah, I believe so. Mr. Lim is one of the best in the business uh, with extensive experience. And so, you know, his recommendations and his assessment, uh, I, would, I would support and believe what he has said. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question I have um, is regarding your back, your past history in development of projects. So as a developer or former developer, we, um, as you know, construction is very fluid or development of a facility is very fluid. So in, Mr. Um, Lance Wilhelm came up and talked about timetables and dealing with all the development and construction phase. Do you believe his testimony was on par? Uh, yes, he's one of the, yeah, he's one of the most uh, prominent. I mean, you know, his longstanding history with, with Kiwit, uh, yeah, is, you know, he has uh, impeccable con construction uh, development credentials. So, yeah, I would certainly believe what, he's, what his testimony said. Okay, that's all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Funakoshi. Thank you, Commissioner Wong. Commissioners, other questions for Mr. Funakoshi? <laughs> Commissioners? Are there no more questions for Mr. Funakoshi? Commissioner, oh, thank you, Commissioner Okuda. Commissioner Okuda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Funakoshi, for your testimony. Um, can I ask you this? Uh, the statute, specifically HRS section 205-2 parent uh, I believe that small e close parent states the type of land or property which shall be within a conservation district, correct? Okay, I believe so. I don't have the statute in front of me, but you're probably right. Yeah, let me just read the first few words of 205 2 parent small e close parent. It states, and I quote, conservation districts shall include areas necessary for protecting watersheds and water sources, and the statute continues on. I, I only, only wanted to read the initial part which uses the word shall, S-H-A-L-L. -L. Um, do, do you recall that that's what the beginning part of that statute says, that the, that the items that are listed in that part of the statute follows the word shall, that conservation uh, district shall include those types of properties. Yes, yes. And the word shall means it's mandatory, correct? Yes. Those were, now, um, I should note that those were, you know, in the establishment of the boundaries. And here we're talking about a, a boundary amendment as opposed yeah, to the establishment of the boundary. Oh, okay, but, but 205-2E does provide guidance as far as what should be considered in making that decision, correct? Yes. I understand the recommendations of the Office of Planning, which I believe in many, or maybe even in most cases, are very persuasive. Uh, but uh, so, but let me ask you this, because we rely on the Office of Planning, or at least I do, as being uh, more neutral uh, as far as guardian of the, of the public interest. But can I ask you this? Is there evidence in the record which indicates reasons why the property should remain conservation and not uh, redistricted or amended into the urban district? Are there reasons in the record which support keeping this parcel of property in the conservation district? We did not look at it specifically for that. We review it more for appropriateness for amending the district boundary. 
but presumably, you know, it does serve watershed uh, types of uh, natural resource values that, you know, it's logical that this area would have been or is, a, is designated conservation. So certainly now, you know, for a number of reasons, for any number of reasons. Based on your experience and the fact that you have been qualified as an expert, can you state or tell us any other reasons that are reflected in the record why this parcel of property should remain conservation? Um, yeah, again, we did not look at it specifically for uh, retention in the conservation district, but, you know, certainly watershed and, you know, those kinds of values uh, would, you know, make it amenable to remain in the conservation district or would to be reclassified uh, into other districts uh, if they, you know, meet those requirements as well. In, in the Office of Planning making its determination or leading up to its recommendation, did the Office of Planning consider whether or not it would be appropriate to keep the property within the conservation district? Well, that would have been a recommendation for denial. And so, you know, we did not come to that conclusion. So we think that appropriate mitigation measures, petitioner has, uh, you know, gone out of his way in our opinion to uh, make concessions to the community and to impose uh, a ton of mitigation measures that should help protect any potential impacts from the development. Well, I'm not asking about whether or not the petitioner has gone out of his way or not. Uh, my question goes to the decision-making process that has led to the Office of Planning's recommendation. Because for us to consider what weight we should give the Office of Planning's recommendation, do you agree that we should consider um, the thoroughness of the process that you engaged in to reach that uh, decision or recommendation? Uh, yes, absolutely. You know, we have uh, reviewed uh, the environmental impact statement from its inception, preparation notice to draft and final EIS, and gone through all the testimonies and in consulted with uh, state and federal agencies on, on the proposal. You know, we've also yeah, so I think we have uh, considered well the merits of the reclassification proposal and have recommended accordingly, you know, trying to ensure adequate protection of natural resource value, <coughs> mitigation of, uh, you know, potential development impacts. Yeah, I understand you considered the merits of the project. But in coming to your recommendation, did you consider the demerits of the project? Yeah, that goes along with considering the merits. So yes, merits and demerits of the project were considered. Okay, can you please tell me what are some of the demerits of the project that the Office of Planning considered in, uh, before making its recommendation? What were some of the demerits of the project? Yeah, I've pretty much gone through those, but you know, to again summarize the, the potential impacts would be to uh, the endangered species on the site. Uh, it would be to uh, the potential impacts to cultural practices being uh, on the site. It would, there are the uh, potential development impacts from stormwater runoff and grading that you know need to be addressed and including rockfall that need to be addressed and have been uh, thoroughly vetted by the petitioner in his mitigation measures there's a potential traffic impacts that you know we've consulted with the state department of transportation on and um, 
And whether it's you know, water resources or air quality or other types of environmental uh, impacts that the state has jurisdiction over, we believe we've thoroughly considered those in making our recommendations. Now, isn't it true that an owner of property which is designated conservation has no legal duty or obligation to maintain cultural resources on that property? Or to be more specific, if I own the parcel of property and there was a heiau located on the property, I could simply let the heiau rot away by allowing uh, bushes, trees, all sorts of things to grow as long as I don't affirmatively do things to damage or destroy the property. In other words, benign neglect is frankly, might be immoral, but it's okay under the law as you understand it, correct? I believe so, yes. So would it be fair to say that what the community is being presented here is a trade-off? I mean, being really very frank about it. I'm not saying, well, maybe I am saying it's like a quid pro quo. It's a promise to do certain things by the petitioner, which is not otherwise required of the petitioner in exchange for the community giving up certain things. That's what we're really weighing. Isn't that correct? It is one of the community benefits uh, that is being offered by the petitioner that we fully support. Yeah, so in other words, it, it's, it's, a, it's a weighing decision. Is the community getting its money's worth in exchange for what it's giving up? I mean, being very frank about it. That, that's what we're really talking about here. Would you agree as a professional planner? Uh, no, I don't look at it necessarily in that light. It's it's more, it's more from the standpoint of you know what, what the petitioner is willing to do, um, to mitigate potential impacts. And this is certainly uh, one of the ones that would be involved. And petitioner has done a very good job in in crafting both a preserve and a plan for preservation of sites in the area. And that's very commendable. And we support it as part of the development's approval. What specific promise has the petitioner made as shown in the record of specific actions which would be taken, for example, to preserve the heiau? And when I say specific actions, I don't mean simply, oh, I promise I'm gonna take care of the heiau. In other words, I'm asking where in the record is there evidence of specific actions which will be taken to preserve the hail by the petitioner. I'm not, I don't want to speak for the petitioner. I'm not, I'm not, but you know, just the provision and allowance for uh, unrestricted access, I think is really, is really commendable. And I think, you know, they're promising to both maintain and preserve uh, that in the future incorporating the culture preserve within the conservation easement. I think all of that and, you know, willing, willingness to work with both the uh, Hawaiian Civic Club and, and the community, I think are all commendable and, and goes to show their, their willingness uh, to do this. Yeah, Mr. Funakoshi, because I kind of believe the devil's in the details, so I'm just asking about the details. Isn't it true that under Hawaii law, whether it's the PASH, P-A-S-H decision or the general provisions of the Hawaii Constitution, that cultural practitioners cannot be denied access to the heiau, whether or not there's a boundary change here. Yes, I would say so. So in other words, a promise by the petitioner or anyone else to assure that cultural practitioners would have access to the heiau. Really, that's not giving cultural practitioners anything additional or anything in addition to what the law already guarantees those cultural practitioners, correct? That's true. Although they are making improvements and improving the access, 
that does make it a lot easier for cultural practitioners to use that site. Now, in coming to the recommendation uh, that the Office of Planning came to, did the Office of Planning take into consideration whether or not the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club, Club or whichever civic club or community organization would be given management rights uh, or control rights over the cultural preserve, whether that organization would also be provided the resources to carry out such management functions or preservation functions? Uh, no, we did not get into that detail, no. Would that be a concern that the Office of Planning would have that an entity or organization may be given the power or the right to exercise control or, or preservation, but not be given the funds or the resources to actually carry out that preservation or control function. Would that be a concern? Uh, not overly, you know, these are pretty much volunteer uh, organizations that, you know, basically staffed by volunteers and, you know, there's, there's some maintenance that possibly, but uh, it's not normal that you would, you would necessarily allocate or require a petitioner to provide resources uh, for, uh, for that, for ongoing maintenance. I think it would be something that I guess it would be nice, but I don't see how we would require that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the Land Use Commission necessarily has or should exercise that type of function. I'm just trying to find out whether or not the office planning considered certain factors and coming to its recommendation so that at least I personally can take into account whether or not this is a good deal or not a good deal for the community. I think, I, I, yeah, the, I think the important thing is really the identification and initial consultation with, you know, who would be a management organization or caretaker for the cultural preserve. I think that in itself is the biggest step uh, in ensuring long-term uh, preservation. Okay, now you testified about your evaluation of Mr. Lim's expertise. And you, uh, and Mr. Lim's testimony, and let me ask you this, did you hear his testimony about foreseeable dangers arising from rockfall? And I don't want to go over it because his testimony is what it stated in the, in the transcript. You heard his testimony, correct? Yes. yes. Did you have any reason to doubt or criticize any of Mr. Lim's testimony about foreseeability or matters with respect to rockfall dangers? No, because simply because, you know, they are, uh, they need to be very careful in what they say and how they manage knowing the potential, potential impacts from what rockfalls, you know, throughout the islands. So they are very careful and in my opinion, they know what they're, whereof they speak. And I would, <clears throat> I would certainly believe and endorse their recommendation. Okay. And, and again, Mr. Lim's testimony is, Mr. Lim's testimony is reflected in the transcript. But do you agree that what this development does is actually bring the public into a zone of danger, even though the zone of danger or the level of dangerousness might be attempted to mitigate, be mitigated. But what's going on here really is development brings the public into a zone of danger, a foreseeable zone of danger. That could occur <clears throat> with or without development, but any development potentially that is 
upslope of another development has that potential for uh, whether it's rock fall or landslides or those kinds of erosion impacts. And it's always a matter of degree and how you address and mitigate. And to the extent that things are foreseeable, to do what you can to mitigate, you know, is really the best course of action. Is it the Office of Planning's position, based on its recommendation, that no one will be foreseeably placed at the risk of serious bodily injury or death because of this development? No, I'm not willing to say that. Is there anything in the record right now that indicates that given the fact that the property has been in the conservation district, that that fact has encouraged people to be brought into a zone of danger from rockfall? <clears throat> uh Wait, I don't understand. Can you repeat your question? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a bad question. Let me let me withdraw it and let me see if I can just ask a couple less uh, questions. One of the things the Hawaii Constitution states is that when we look to develop Hawaii's resources, we need to look at the issue of self-sufficiency and sustainability, correct? Uh, I believe so. Now, very early in this proceeding, I had asked uh, the president of Hawaiian Memorial Park, and, uh, and, and let me back up a bit. You, you do agree that Hawaiian Memorial Park is actually a wholly owned subsidiary of Service Corporation International, SCI, correct? Right, that's what they said. And in fact, uh, I believe they included some SEC filings showing the uh, financial stability or financial resources of SCI. And that's part of the record. Do you recall seeing that? Okay, we did not review that specifically, but okay, I do recall reference to that corporation, yes. Yeah, I, I, I think it might have been the 10Q or I'm not sure. I don't think it was the 10K uh, form, but in any event, um, you, you do, or do you dispute, or do you agree the statement that Service Corporation International, the owner of Hawaiian Memorial Park, is the world's largest cemetery, mortuary, uh, funerary company? Mr. Mr. Okuda, um, respectfully, in the interest of time. Okay, I'll, I'll, okay let me just ask the question. Go really well established on the record and get to the core of your questioning. Yeah, I'm not qualified or I, I'm not aware, I'm not sure that that that's correct or incorrect, but yeah, I don't, I don't know actually. Okay, in, in, in coming to the, the uh, recommendation of the Office of Planning, did the Office of Planning consider or take into account the net profits that this development would remove from the community and be transferred to Service Corporation International. In other words, how much money would be taken out in dollars from the community by this development in exchange for whatever the demerits were that the Office of Planning considered would be part of this uh, project? Uh, no, that was not one of our considerations. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no further questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Okuda. Commissioners, are there any further questions for Mr. Funakoshi? Oh, um, Commissioner Axon followed by Commissioner Giovanni. Good morning, uh, Mr. Funakoshi. Uh, th thank you for coming and attending this meeting without the subpoena. <laughs> so I guess during the discussions and questioning, you mentioned about uh, the merits and the demerits of the project. And uh, instead of, you know, in spite of those demerits, 
the Office of Planning still uh, proposed to approve the project? Is it because the merits outweighs the demerits, or is it because you are satisfied uh, with the proposed uh, mitigations that Office of Planning uh, proposing? I'm just kind of wondering how you came up, you know, uh, in spite of those demerits, how you came up with uh, 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 proposing to approve the project. Okay, yes, we, you know, we primarily look at the appropriateness of the reclassification and then how uh, mitigation is proposed and, you know, relative to state areas of concern is what it amounts to. And so it's not so much that we look at the merits or demerits of a project, but more the whether uh, it's an appropriate reclassification to the urban district, whether the uh, development uh, adequately and substantially mitigates whatever foreseeable impacts. And on that basis, and you know, with appropriate conditions and with consultation from our uh, other state and federal agencies, we make our decision. And so, you know, we have done that and that's what, that's what our recommendation reflects. So again, uh, so you are confident that, you know, with those proposed mitigations by, by, your, by your office, will satisfy any uh, uh, issues about the demerits that you mentioned earlier? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Buenacoche. Thank you very Thank you. much, Commissioner Axon. Commissioner Giovanni. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Funakoshi, for your testimony today. Uh, are you familiar with the petitioner's uh, grading plan and the consequence of the large volume of, of material that will be removed from the site? Uh, yes, I was here for a testimony on that issue. What is your understanding of the petitioner's commitment regarding the fate of the materials that will be removed from the site, the large volume of material? Yeah, that I am not sure. I would have to take, you know, their engineers and uh, Mr. Wellhelm's uh, testimony uh, relative to, you know, the reuse or how that is absorbed in the in other areas, but I wouldn't doubt what they're saying. I think it, it's uh, plausible that you know good film material is always in demand, and especially in these days where a lot of the developments in the lower lying areas due to sea level potential sea level rise impacts will need to be elevated. So you know a, a lot of the new developments I think would would welcome uh, you know good film material. With that perspective, do you think it would be um, reasonable for the petitioner to make a firm commitment for reuse of that material as fill as opposed to disposal of it in a landfill? Uh, hmm. As a condition, I'm not sure. You know, I'm best qualified to, uh, oh, but, mm, Maybe, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not sure I, I would be prepared to uh, respond to that. I certainly think it's a plausible uh, scenario for reuse of the of the fill. Would you, uh, would you, from your perspective, would you um, state that it would be not only plausible but a favorable alternative to use it as fill as opposed to landfill? Ah, uh, yes. You know, always I think though what you then run into potentially is the need to stockpile that fill if you know like all of it is not uh, available for immediate use. So sometimes that can that can pose a, a separate issue. But but in general, you know, we, I would support um, <clears throat> I would support reuse of the material certainly. You would support it as a favored alternative to landfill or just as an alternative? 
I would say as an alternative, uh, I would, yeah, I'm not sure as a requirement as opposed to, you know, an offer from the petitioner to, to make that kind of commitment would probably be preferable, but yeah, I'm not sure. Thank you. No further questions, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Giovanni. Commissioners, are there further questions for Mr. Funakoshi? If not, I have a couple, and I think that we could go through those and then take a break. Are there any questions, commissioners? Okay, Mr. Funakoshi, I wanna go back to some of your responses to your cross from Commissioner Okuda, because I think respectfully, you might've spoken a little bit outside your area of expertise. Um, and this which had to do with whether or not petitioner would fund maintenance of a cultural preserve or a conservation easement. Um, we qualified you as a land use um, professional and expert, but are you familiar with land trusts at all? Um, not, in, not in any depth, no. Okay, are you aware of the accreditation procedures for land trusts offered by the Land Trust Alliance in the United States? No. Um, so you're not aware that for an accredited land trust, they're not allowed to accept a conservation easement unless they have sufficient funds to properly steward that easement in terms with the conditions of that easement, correct? That's news to oh, Okay, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, so, so accredited land trusts, and there's accredited land trusts and non-accredited land trusts, but accredited land trusts will not maintain their accreditation and enter into an easement unless either through their own fundraising or through the donation of the grantor, they have sufficient funds to maintain whatever values are set to protect. Okay, I so, think and that is exactly what was done or is it being done in the case of the conservation easement being issued in relationship to Waikapu Country Town. I see, okay, no, thank you for that uh, education. So, I was not aware so of that. I, I can't speak to what standards or practices the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club might have over the cultural preserve. But I just wanna make sure that you said it is, really your testimony was, there's no cases where the developer is asked to steward it. And I don't think that that's actually accurate or within your area of expertise. Just want to establish that for the record. Okay, I stand corrected. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything further, commissioners? If not, it is 10:04 a.m. I'd like to call a 10-minute recess to 10:14 a.m. and we will proceed. Unless there, is there going to be any redirect, Ms. Apuna, for Mr. Funakoshi? Yeah. No, okay, we then we'll we'll proceed um, at long last with um, the state's entomologist. Is that correct? Yes. Ms. King, okay. Recess till 1014. It's 1016. Um, I'm going to admit um, Cynthia King, Cynthia King. Um, to the LUC staff. I note Mr. Ye Nate Ewan has his hand raised as an attendee. If it's possible to contact him and see what his concern is. 
Ms. King, you've been promoted to be a panelist. When you come in, enable your audio and video, please. Hello. Hi, it's just gave me a message that I could not be added because I have to leave the by the way. Okay. Um, I mean, like it showed that you tried to add me and then it said you couldn't. Um I'm trying to log back in now because I couldn't. Okay. Okay. Well I'll stay on. Okay. Hey bye. Chair, um Cynthia just called me. She said that um she couldn't get back in because she was previously taken out mm. um, but she's trying to log back in and hopefully you can put her back okay we need that old-fashioned please stand by we're having technical difficulties little icon that they used to have on television um, I, I did note um, Thank you, Commissioner Ohigashi, for that. Um, I, I did not actually do anything to Ms. King's um, thing when I promoted her to be able to speak, but when I tried to say that to remove her when you asked for her earlier and then you said you were gonna go with Mr. Funakoshi, it did indicate that if I, if I had disabled her audio, she wouldn't be able to log back into the meeting, so I did nothing. And then I saw her move back to being an attendee. So um, I don't know if she's going to have to re-register or be provided a code by Mr. Derrickson or something else. But we will stand by. Chair, this is good practice because, I mean, we're learning things every day about Zoom and if in case some other things happen, at least for the future, it, mm -hmm. it helps us. Yeah. Sure. Apologize. Yes, Ms. King. Uh, she, she got a, um, a message that she's unable to rejoin this meeting because you were previously removed by the host. So. Right. So yeah. um, we are working on it. Okay. A different email or um, Mr. Chair, yes, Mr. Hokoda. Um, we're having difficulty making communications, but we'd like to suggest perhaps if she uses a different email address to access the meeting, she might be admitted. Can she try that, please? Okay. Okay, we're working on it. I'm going to blame Ms. Apuna for calling her first and then <laughs> saying no. I apologize for that. Yeah, and if we we're going to lose somebody, I would have been fine with it being Mr. Funakoshi rather than Ms. King. So.
Chair, does OP have any other witness? No, Cynthia is our last witness. Yeah. Um, Ms. Opuna, can you give me uh, Cynthia's email address and I can, I'll send her a, a panelist link. Don't do it over this. Though. Okay. Not, not it's, uh, email it to Howard. Okay, could you email it to my uh, state address then, please? Folks, we are working on it. Um, sorry, folks. Um, Chair, you want to take another five minute break, a recess? Um, sure, let's go officially off the record while we try and do this. It's 10.23, we will reconvene at 10.28. Um, wait, yeah, okay, 10.23, we'll reconvene at 10.28. Simply delicious. Have to I know you did that just so I would walk away and you and I'd be more late than you. Briefly, it flashed and then went away. I saw the name Cynthia King flash up on the email and then, or in the window and then go away. She's coming. If she's admitted as a attendee, she should raise her hand so I can find her easily. Sorry, everyone. Oh, looks like we have her. Ms. King, we, we can't be, there you go. Um, we don't have audio yet. Can we try saying something? You have to unmute. Here we go. It just gave me the option to unmute right there. I don't Welcome know what, uh, to the meeting. That, but for some reason, okay. since you had uninvited me to the meeting previously, my computer really didn't want to let me interrupt you again, apparently. <laughs> okay. I'm going to restart the meeting officially at 1031. Um, thank you for your persistence and everyone's patience. I think we're doing okay that since starting virtual meetings in early May. This is the worst problem we've had so far. So um, I'm going to swear you in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth? Yes, it is. Okay. I do. Please proceed, Ms. Apuna. 
Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Cynthia. Uh, good morning. Can you, good morning. Can you please provide or uh, describe your educational and professional background? Sure. Um, I received my BS in Environmental Science Policy and Management from the University of California, Berkeley in 2001, and my master's in entomology from the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 2008. I am the entomologist for the Department of Land and Natural Resources, Division of Forestry and Wildlife, and I've been in the position since 2009. Um, I created and I currently manage the Hawaii Invertebrate Program, which is the first program in the state to focus on the conservation and management of native invertebrates, with a specific emphasis on rare, threatened, and endangered species. Ms. King, can you slow down slightly? Yes. Thank you. Um, the work I do is funded by and conducted in close coordination with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Thank you, Ms. King. Um, Chair, OP requests that Ms. King be qualified as an expert in entomology. Um, any objections from the petitioner? Petitioner has no objections. County. County of, City and County of Honolulu. City has no objections. Thank you. And interveners have no objections. Thank you. Commissioners? Ms. King is admitted as an expert in entomology. Please continue, Ms. Apuna. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms. King, can you please summarize your testimony? Sure. Um, I'm familiar with this petition because the DEIS was circulated to DLNR for review in 2018, and myself and other staff compiled comments on behalf of our division. Um, I was aware of the presence of uh, Meglagrian nigrohematum nigrolineatum at the site prior to the formal consultation process as I was responsible for issuing a native invertebrate research and collecting permit to Dr. Montgomery um, when he was initiating the surveys um, for invertebrates in 2007. And I also did um, okay. have some contacts with local Ms. King, sorry, just yes? slightly slower, slightly slower. Okay. Um, I did have some contacts with community members who reached out to me um, because they were concerned about the damselfly species at the site. Um, the black line damselfly, Megalagrian nigrohematum nigrolineatum, uh, is a subspecies which is endemic to Oahu. Um, historically, the species was found in both the Waianae and the Ko'ula mountain ranges. And um, most recent literature indicates that it's still extant in 17 populations across the island. Um, as a result of the declines in 2012, it was listed federally as an endangered species under the Endangered Species Act of 1973. Uh, the preferred breeding habitat for the species um, includes pools and slow moving stretches of stream, um, often montane perennial streams, and they're generally found at higher elevations. Um, at this site, the damselfly inhabits seep habitat, which is associated with a previously dug well where natural discharge of groundwater flows through permeable soils. The DEIS acknowledges, acknowledges that extensive earthwork, including the installation of retaining walls and movement of fill could potentially compress the soils in the area upslope of the seep and well and alter water flow um, to the seep. The reduction of water flow, um, increased turbidity or increased temperatures um, in the surface water flowing from the seep is a potential concern because the immature stages of this species are aquatic and they rely on the continuous supply of clean, cool water um, in order to um, complete their immature stages. Um, it's also possible that runoff from the landscaped area could ne negatively impact the area if landscaping staff adopt management other than what is referenced in the DEIS. However, at present, it's stated that no fertilizers or pesticides are used to maintain the area, uh, only glyphosate, which is not documented to adversely impact native invertebrates. Also, we know from experience that other native damselfly species appear to persist, even in proximity to highly landscaped urban areas, um, which seems counterintuitive, but um, we have examples of some of our other endangered species persisting in um, ponds and golf courses, um, for example, on the island of Lanai, and also the grounds of Tripler Army Medical Hospital. Um, 
I reviewed the avoidance and minimization measures as proposed in the DEIS specific to the damselfly and found them to be sound recommendations. Um, one of the most important measures, um, the most important is the installation of a temporary and then permanent water line to provide water to the seep in the event that flow to the seep is adversely impacted. Though um, I have to defer to, on hydrology to our Commission of Water Resources Management who reviewed the DEIS for that component. Um, so, so it was initially proposed um, as an avoidance and minimization, avoidance and minimization strategy to in, <clears throat> implement a temporary and then permanent water line. Um, and I do think that is a very necessary measure um, should the expansion move forward. Um, what we don't want is to have any delay in restoring water um, to the habitat in the event any surface flows are reduced um, or in the event of any unexpected contamination. So any prolonged reduction in flow could result directly in take of the species. Um, but a temporary and a permanent water line would enable resource managers to respond quickly if concerning data or trends were ob observed. Um, additional mitigation measures such as fencing the area from pigs um, will prevent ongoing degradation of the habitat and um, providing safe areas for damselfly naiads to um, crawl out of and emerge. Um, also has the potential to increase emergent success and overall abundance of the species at the site, um, reducing predation from native ants. Um, the primary threat to not just damselflies, but most rare invertebrate species in Hawaii is the impact of invasive species, whether that's um, competition, direct predation, habitat destruction or habitat alteration. Um, left alone, it's common for rare invertebrates to just blink out of our field sites, uh, where on even, um, especially at sites where ongoing management or monitoring isn't being conducted, um, when we don't sort of um, have eyes on the site to understand what new threats might be present. Um, so in my opinion, the avoidance and minimization measures um, proposed for the site would increase the likelihood that this population would be preserved in perpetuity. Um, if take were anticipated, the DLNR would request the petitioner to apply for an incidental take license under the state endangered species law, which is chapter 195D of HRS. The process works in tandem with the federal incidental take permit process under the Endangered Species Act. And take of this endangered damsel flight at the site is prohibited under 195 DHRS unless that take occurs as a result of an otherwise lawful activity, which is permitted with an incidental take license and, and has an accompanying habitat conservation plan. However, DOFA's position in the letter we submitted is, what is, is if the petitioner follows all the avoidance uh, measures described in the letter, take should be avoided and an incidental take license would not be needed. Given the intense monitoring that is proposed um, and that would be ongoing at the site, I believe it would be very apparent if the proposed measures were not being implemented properly or if those measures were failing in some way to prevent impacts to the habitat. If that occurs, the petitioner would be liable for take under the Endangered Species Act that under our state law and our federal law. Um, there's a recent precedent where take of a listed invertebrate occurred on the island of Oahu and the civil penalty was $25,000 per invertebrate killed. Um, so I believe that the landowner is aware of this and would be very motivated um, to make sure that all of the avoidance and minimization efforts were implemented um, as they should be. And that said, with having outlined the whole process um, for, for a landowner to participate in a um, in getting a take license approved, our preference is always to avoid take. Our first preference is always to avoid take of the species entirely because essentially in approving an incidental take license, we're saying you can kill all these things potentially and then mitigate it in some other way, whether that is on the property in a different location, whether it's on a different property, giving us financial resources. And so typically the preference of our agency is to not result in any direct mortality to the species where possible. Um, so that's the summary of my testimony for now. I have a feeling there will probably be questions and I can touch on some of the other 
um, components if, if needed. Thank you, Ms. King. Um, Ms. King is available for questions. Thank you. We'll start off with the petitioner. Petitioner has no question. Thank you. City and County of Honolulu. Uh, the city has no questions. Okay. Uh, Intervenor is Huyo Pikoiloa, Mr. Yoshimori. Hello, thank you. Nice to finally meet you or see you uh, virtually, Ms. King. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, um, Mr. Funakoshi had deferred this question to you. Um, I had spoken to both uh, you know, Fish and Wildlife's Deputy Field Supervisor Ku and also to Dan Polhemis, and they both say that they had not been, um, they haven't been reviewed, they haven't reviewed the black line damselfly mitigations proposed by the, um, DOFA. So has DOFA reviewed the damselfly protection mitigations with the Fish and Wildlife Service? Not in the most recent draft. So we did have a consultation with Fish and Wildlife Service when we first, um, both agencies were initially uh, uh, drafting letters in response to the DEIS, um, but following that, we did not have um, a, a consultation meeting, and 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 partially that's important because I think both agencies have uh, separate um, and very important roles to play, and so it, it's it's good to make sure both agencies have their perspectives, you know. Come, I'm in. Sorry, sorry, I need to cut you off. No, it's okay. Um, so that um, consultation happened prior to the final DIS. There, there was a response to respond to the, the draft EIS. Um, a letter was produced by the Fish and Wildlife Service to DOFA. Um, so that consultation happened prior to that response from DOFA. I'm sorry, prior to the response from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Is that correct? I believe that's the case, uh, but I, I would have to double check the dates to be absolutely sure. Thank you. And. Um, if a supplemental water line is provided under the current conditions, um, would that be preferable, preferable to allowing the development to have that supplemental water line put in? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I, I think I didn't quite understand it. So given the current conditions, say we left the development, or left the area undeveloped, and um, a supplemental water line was put in to provide water to the damselfly habitat. Um, would that be preferable than allowing the development to proceed, um, doing the uphill upgrading, uh, grading of the hillside? Um, instead of doing that, uh, is it preferable to just put in the supplemental water line under current conditions rather than doing the development in order to get that supplemental water line? Um. I think that's an interesting question. I think if you weren't doing any upslope development, hypothetically, you wouldn't need to put in a, a water line. Um, having a guaranteed source of water, even during prolonged droughts, for example, could be a benefit to the species, though, uh, say, if uphill development uh, didn't move forward. Um, so I, I think it would be a net benefit in either case. Did that answer your question? It did. Thank you. Those, those are all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yoshimori. Commissioners, if you want to use your, the raise hand function, that helps. Uh, starting with Commissioner Okuda. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. King, do you have an opinion as far as what is the future probability of the situation of this damselfly population if everything was left as is and there was no development. I, I, and, and let me be more specific. You, you testified about populations, I believe you used the term blinking out. Um, do you have an opinion about whether or not this population faces that type of probable risk if there's no development that it might blink out? I do think that's always the case with our invertebrate populations I mean, and other native species as well. I shouldn't just say um, invertebrates, but when I say species here, I'm gonna be just referring to invertebrates or insects. Um, I do think that's the case. Um, I was able to visit the site in June for the first time and um, the proximity to a residential area, um, you know, with, uh, you know, just sort of the 
general urban interface always has more of a, um, a potential for pests, new pests, different pests, um, different ant species, um, different predators um, or competitors. Um, it's, it's just a, a possible um, means by which other invasive um, predators or other species could come in and, and cause adverse effects at the site. Um, I'm not saying that it is going to happen, but that's, that's one of the first things sort of that I, I noticed the proximity to, to current development or, and, and um, unmanaged, or managed areas. So I, I think that it's always a possibility. Um, I think that they've persisted there for a long time. Um, and I think that that habitat um, is very safe from their primary uh, predator, which are Pisilia, the uh, mosquito fish, uh, which are typically enter the habitat through surface water flows from lower elevation, lower stream reaches. And so what's very nice about that spot is it doesn't have surface water um, flow connection or connectivity to lower reaches where the fish would come in unless someone um, put them in there, um, you know, intentionally for some reason, which, which seems lo a low likelihood. Um, so in general, the site has, has been maintained for a while. It's, it's always just really hard to predict um, how long they'll persist though. Okay, and if you can't offer an opinion, that's fine. But would you be able to uh, provide a, an opinion about what do you think the uh, habitat would be, if at all, regarding the damselfly 50 years from now, if this development did not proceed? Or is that too speculative? I think it's speculative, but I don't think it's far-fetched to say that the <laughs> the population could succumb to the invasion of some invasive species, some invasive predator. It's just something that we see every day, whether it's um, little fire ants um, coming over from Big Island or, or, um, um, or the introduction of something unintentional into an area. So I think just because of the current trajectory um, of the declines across the state of so many of our native um, damselflies, um, it's, it's, it's not far-fetched to say that that population um, you know, if not monitored and, and if active management isn't ongoing, it could um, succumb to some sort of impacts of invasive species. Okay, yeah, and uh, this is my final question, and it's similar to my quid pro quo question I had asked Mr. Funakoshi, uh, and especially since I, I know nothing about invasive species uh, or endangered species or the requirements of that. You had mentioned a $25,000 per invertebrate fine. But let me ask you this, the similar type of question I asked Mr. Funakoshi. If I owned this parcel of property and it's designated conservation, if I just exercised uh, what I described as benign neglect, not active neglect, just benign neglect, I just, just let the property just stay the way it is, I don't do anything with it, and the damselfly population disappears, even though if I actively could have done something, I could have preserved it. My benign neglect, would you agree, might be immoral, but it doesn't lead to any type of legal liability or liability from your agency. Would that be a fair statement? That's a fair statement. And that's something that we've seen um, on other private land holdings um, on both Oahu and neighbor islands, and it's an unfortunate consequence. Okay, but benign neglect, as much as it's something that we might say is not, it shouldn't be something a landowner should do. It's my right that I could just benignly neglect the damselfly population. Or let me put it this yeah, way. So yes, you're not obligated to do management for an endangered species just because it's on your property. And in, in most cases, you, I, I don't want to overstate, but many private land owners aren't um, in a position to do that, right? They're not allowed to um, interact with the species unless you're permitted. You're not allowed to move them or, or even um, traverse a habitat that's, um, that's occupied by them. So it's almost a requirement that they have, that the, those areas often have a benign neglect when it's especially when it's private homeowners or, or smaller landowners. It's different when it's a larger um, private landowner, such as like Kamehameha Schools or Nature Conservancy, or so some of our, our, you know, the bigger known landowners that have more ability to engage in management or work with partners on their lands. 
but I'd say it's, it's often out of the, um, both the um, sort of realm of awareness as well as legally what most private individuals could do. Um, they're, they're mostly obligated not to do anything and that results in benign neglect. So, so in other words, uh, to be blunt, if one of the goals or objectives is to have active management and active protection of the damselfly, the quid pro quo might have to be to agree to this boundary amendment uh, petition, correct? I don't think that it has to be. I think it can be. And it, um, I, I think it is something that is more likely to result um, in it in this case. I shouldn't say that, actually, scratch that. I'm, that's, that's an opinion. I don't know that that's true. Um, but I, I think in other cases, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to say. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. No further questions. Thank you, Commissioner Okuda. Commissioner Chang. Thank you, Ms. Um, thank you, Chair, and um, good morning, Ms. King. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I think I'd like to ask you your opinion, um, a question in a, in a different way than from Commissioner Okuda. Um, is it your opinion, based upon what I'm hearing, is it your opinion that the avoidance and minimization mitigation measures proposed by the petitioner provides the species the best chance of success or you know, survival by um, the ongoing monitoring, the placement of the temporary and permanent waterline, that those measures um, provide, in keeping out invasive species, that they provide the species the greatest chance of succeeding, of surviving? I do think that it provides the species a very solid chance of persisting and, and, and of resource managers being able to intervene in some way if we see a new impact to the site, whether that be, you know, in a change in water flow or um, a new organism introduced there. And based upon the information that you now have, there's, you have baseline, you have, you have an indication of, of how, you know, the number of species that are there, the conditions. So through the monitoring, you will be able to determine whether there's been, you know, um, whether the landowner is not complying with the conditions um, to determine whether there's a take. Um, is, would you say that's fair? I, I would say that if the proposed avoidance and minimization can, um, yeah, those measures are formalized, then yes, that, that provides a really excellent mechanism of, of monitoring and data collection. Um, I should clarify that we don't have a baseline at the site, especially for invertebrates, doing one site visit or even two site visits um, isn't sufficient typically. And that's why we did propose um, one year of pre-monitoring to establish baselines. Or I, actually, I should clarify, I, I don't have it in front of me, so it might be it was six months to one year would be what I remember. Um, because with invertebrate populations, they can fluctuate so much at, at any given interval if there's more uh, immatures in the water, for example, than there are adults um, flying around at a given time because of temperatures and rainfall and all that stuff. But yeah, I think if we have that um, baseline data and, and then monitoring it continues beyond uh, the life of the project, then uh, that would be a really excellent source to make um, adaptive management decisions. Okay. And with respect to jurisdiction, um, trying to understand there's this U.S. Fish and Wildlife letter that's out there that's mm -hmm. indicated that there's um, their, their objections. Um, as I understood your testimony, um, there was, when the initial EIS came out, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and DLNR engaged in consultation and you reviewed the proposed EIS, is that correct, the draft? 
we did. Um, and at that time, um, were there issues that both of both U.S. Fish and Wildlife and DLNR had with respect to um, the endangered species? Yes, I think we did. We both, um, biologists from both agencies, and I don't want to speak on their behalf, but I think it, it, summarizing is okay. I think we both had concerns about the potential impacts to hyd hydrogeology. Um, myself not being um, an expert in that area, though, I can really only speak to the damselflies, and I, need, I have to defer to our, um, our folks um, within the Commission of Water Resources Management who sort of um, gave their feedback on that component. Whereas I think the biologists at Fish and Wildlife Service, um, they, didn't, they don't have a accompanying water resources division specifically. They have an aquatic um, program um, whose full name I can't remember right now. But anyway, so those staff are the folks that weighed in on it. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, we both represented the concerns that we had at that time and then how it got sort of formalized in the, in the letters, you know. Is your state agency different. the Commission on Water Resource Management? Is the division of ours that it got, yeah, those, so the, those components um, that related to the grading and the, the water flow, yeah, that's what they, so, so I, we acknowledged in our DOFA letter that, that that seemed like a concern to us, but we couldn't speak to the, the significance, really, like what those true impacts would be. Um, okay. So we could just say, it, we're concerned we're hearing from other folks who we consider experts that there shouldn't be significant flow impacts, but in the event that there are, that's why we want these other avoidance and minimization measures in place because should there be impacts, then that's taken care of. And, um, you know, for better or for worse, we do have a population of endangered damselfly at Tripler, Tripler Army Medical Center that is in an area that is fed by a hose. So we we know that while that is not ideal for conservation, that that tool um, does exist and it works. Okay, um, and I'm not gonna ask you to speak up on behalf of U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but based upon now the final EIS and the avoidance and minimization measures, um, you are comfortable that your concerns that seem to be similarly shared by the Fish and Wildlife but only speaking on your behalf, you are comfortable with the avoidance and minimization measures that they have adequately addressed the concerns that you had. I am comfortable with that, yes. Okay. All right, um, I have no further questions. Thank you so much, Mrs. Ms. King. That really, your testimony was extremely helpful. I'm glad we were able to get you online. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry for the difficulties. No, no. Thank you, Commissioner Chang. Um, commissioners, are there further questions for Ms. King? If not, I, oh, Commissioner Axon, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just one clarification, Ms. King. Uh, I just want to clarify. If an endangered species like density fly is found on a private property, I uh, just want to kind of clear my mind. Who is responsible to protect and preserve that uh, said endangered species? Is it the landowner or some kind of agency? Well, that's a great question. So this, the species are protected under, um, under our wildlife rules. Um, if they're endangered, it's chapter 195D. Um, we also have uh, ch chapter 124. Uh, for species that are, in, I think, native and indigenous, but not necessarily endangered. Um, so they are public trust resources that are, are governed by those laws. And if there is known or documented take, then it doesn't matter what um, land it's on. If there's documented intentional sort of no knowing take, then it doesn't matter what land it's on if, if there's an ability to conduct enforcement or um, have an administrative action on that through um, either our, our board, our Board of Land and Natural Resources or our Division of Conservation and Resource Enforcement. Um, but there's not a responsibility, for example, if those species are on private lands um, 
for there to be active management of them by DLNR or by the private landowner. It's certainly encouraged and we try to partner wherever is possible. And actually that's why the partners, the US Fish and Wildlife Service par Partners in Wildlife Conservation program that was mentioned earlier um, could be a, a, an ideal pairing for this site. Um, it, it's a site that would qualify for it because they have the private land component and they can qualify for um, um, funds to do um, sort of applied enhancement um, restoration at a site um, through that program. So that's my long-winded way of saying there are ways to, to try and enhance those partnerships and encourage that, but it is not required by law. So just, my, that's my understanding. <laughs> just to be specific, what is uh, uh, the extent of responsibility by, by the landowner? What is required of the landowner uh, about these uh, endangered species? You mentioned before that you know it is discouraged for them to do anything. So I just kind of understand what the extent. If I'm the landowner, what am I supposed to do? Do I do I do something? Do I you know? I just want to kind of clear on my mind what is the landowner's responsibility on this. Their responsibility is not to um, impose intentional take, intentional harm, harass, pursue, um, certainly harvest, or anything of those um, organisms found on that land. So for, for some private landowners, that does mean just leaving that area entirely um, and not doing any work or management or interfering in any way. Um, and and as, as the term that's been used um, by the other commissioner um, is as a result, sometimes that results in benign neglect and, and therefore extirpation of a species. Other times, other species can persist just fine. Um, and so that lack of management is not a, an issue at all. It just depends on the species we're looking at. Um, sorry, I think I went off topic of your question. All right. So I, I would assume that there is a, uh, a big penalty or financial liability uh, by the landowner if the landowner, you know, uh, damage or do something to, uh, uh, or neglect the, the endangered species. There would be potential consequences for any landowner who took an action that they that resulted in the take of the species whether they intended for that action to result in take or not whether they let their dogs run on an area that had nay nay but they didn't realize it happened and it resulted in the the loss of nay nay on their property um that could be actionable but uh a landowner with Nene on their property, for example, that didn't fence them in and therefore those Nene would got eaten by feral cats. That is not, my understanding is that is not the landowner, that is, that is not the responsibility of the landowner to have to do habitat level management actions that are significant for the species. That's, that's not a burden that is put on them. That's my understanding and I'm happy to get back to you with, um, with specifics after this to make sure I'm correct though. So by doing this development, you kind of pretty much transfer there's some responsibility to, to the landowner then. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? So in doing this development, uh, kind of somehow transfer some responsibility to the, the landowner to make sure it's protected and preserved. Yeah, I, I don't know that it's transferring responsibility. I think the landowner not responsibility, and responsibility, not all, but some responsibility. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's essentially, um, my understanding is that the land would go into a conservation easement, which um, would protect the land and habitat and sort of access in perpetuity for management purposes. So I, I don't think it absolves the landowner in any way. For example, if they took, again, if they continued to take actions on their property that resulted in take, they would be cited for that uh, and, and penalized for that. Um, but it, it, yeah, so I don't think it 
changes the burden of responsibility in that it's still tied to their um, to their private land. I understand. Um, but I would defer to um, uh, to Dr. Watson on that. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Ms. King. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Axon. Is there anything further, Commissioners? Commissioners? Um, Ms. King, I, I have a, a, a brief question for you or a set of questions. Um, I note that um, the majority of the mitigation plan for protecting this damselfly deals with um, both physical infrastructure and actions and then um, monitoring. But there's no community engagement or enrollment part to this mitigation plan, is there? Not that I recall seeing. Do, do you think it's important that um, the neighboring community would at least be aware of, if not somehow enrolled in the protection of the species? That's a good question. Um, I think that it is important to have education, outreach, awareness always about our species and the importance of conservation, the importance of conservation. Um, there are limitations to having direct community involvement with management of endangered, federally endangered species though. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I know from other examples of other, um, working with other species in proximity to other communities, you know, there are some limitations on that. Even in the best intentioned folks, that maybe if they don't come from a biology background, um, they would be very hard to sort of get approved from US Fish and Wildlife Service to do even monitoring of a species um, sometimes. Um, the programs um, that involve community, involve, uh, that rely on community involvement the most are I think a lot of times related to things like water birds and monk seals, where you don't have to get very close to a species to be able to get some really good data on it and share those data with resource management agencies. And invertebrates are a little bit different because <laughs> you kind of have to almost be right on top of them a lot of times to be able to, to do that work efficiently. And so it's, it's a little bit harder to incorporate untrained um, participants. And, and so we limit that in a lot of the applied management that we do for rare snails on the island and other rare, rare species. It's not to say that we wouldn't love to figure out a way to involve people more so. And I think um, with, um, with the civic group that, that, or any civic group that could take responsibility for the site, if the um, conservation and, and the species information could be um, you know, inter integrated into, into sort of the information that's provided to volunteers, um, I think that will be really valuable. Um, and I think maybe there's other ways to um, consider how folks could get involved with the damselfly, um, but I think it would take a lot of, um, yeah, it would take a lot more planning, which I, I, you know, I don't know would move forward unless um, this project was moving forward for sure. Yeah, so certainly I'm not, not, you know, not necessarily species counts or monitoring or going in, but, but if I understood your, um, testimony correctly, one of the things that can um, harm these species is the introduction of mosquito fish. And so you don't want the neighbors who are, yeah. just happen to be concerned about mosquitoes and they're like, oh yeah, I remember seeing some standing water over there, right? So, so. Yes, absolutely. So that sort of outreach is really valuable. Um, so the, the Land Use Commission has the opportunity, if we approve projects to put conditions on, and certainly the documents so far have spelled out Again, the herringbone drainage, the, the leap throughout pig fencing, the monitoring, the um, additional water supply as conditions. Would you be able to articulate, even on a rough level, any community engagement portions of the conservation efforts that would be promote the conservation of the species? You know, I think on the fly, I wouldn't be comfortable trying to, to put something forward. Um, it's definitely not an area of expertise for me. Uh, we have folks that um, put a lot of thought into our education outreach and communications and how um, they're really important and they're really important to do right. Um, so I, I do think it's an important component, but I don't know that I could articulate something right now that would be um, valuable to you. Just to, just to restate though, but you do feel it's important 
even perhaps an essential component of the conservation is not just to have the operational aspects on the ground, but to also have some. Certainly, because if essentially if we're inviting, inviting a lot of um, community members to the site that wouldn't normally be there, then there is going to be that uh, potential risk that they could un you know, have unintentional impacts on the species if they aren't aware of it. So yeah, I think it would be um, really integral to and, and valuable to potentially have it spelled out if, um, if that were the case. Thank you very much. I have nothing further. Is there anything further, commissioners? If there's not, do you have any direct, uh, redirect, Ms. Apuna? Uh, no redirect. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. King. I will now remove you from the meeting and hopefully not permanently if we need to call you back, but I don't think we do, so. Okay. Um, thank you. And, thank you for your time, um, Commissioner. Thank you. Okay, Ms. King has become an attendee. And um, Ms. Apuna, do you have anything further right now? Uh, no, I don't. That concludes OP's uh, presentation. Okay. Are there any further questions from the commission for OP at this time? If, if not, we can um, move on to the intervener. Um, at least to begin, Mr. Yoshimori, can you give me an overview of what you're hoping to do with the remainder of our time together today, including a lunch break? Uh, we have five of our six witnesses available for testimony. One of them was called away to help with uh, HPD and his area of expertise. Um, so I'm hoping we will complete all of them by today. Okay. Um, I think we might be able to get through our first testifier um, before lunch. Okay. Um, maybe two. Okay. Um, I'm going to say, uh, who's your first tech, who's your next testifier? Our first your testifier first? is um, Mr. Winston Welch of the Outdoor Circle. Okay. So I'm going to let Mr. Welch in, but then I'm going to go, it's 11.13. I want to take a five minute, since we've been going about an hour, five minute restroom break recess, and then we will reconvene at 11.18 with Mr. Winston Welch. Thank you. And I tested with Mr. Welch while we were on break, so this should be smoother than the previous. Yes, in fact, he's already here. Thank you, Commissioner Cabral. We are awaiting Commissioners Giovanni and Ohigashi. Hey. I have to wash my hands for 30 seconds or 20 seconds. are living in a pandemic. Just awaiting Commissioner Giovanni as well as Ms. Apuna. Commissioner Giovanni? There we go. Great. Okay. Thanks for the quick break. It's 11.19 a.m. We're back on the record. Mr. Yoshimori is calling his first witness, Winston Welch. I'm going to swear you in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give us the truth? I do. Okay. Um, please proceed with your direct examination, Thank you. Mr. Yoshimori. And for the record, um, Mr. Welch's resume is Intervenors Exhibit Number 4. Uh, so thank you for testifying today, Mr. Welch. Um, can you please state your name and address for the record? Yes, my name is Winston Welch and uh, address is 1314 South King Street, number 306 in Honolulu, Hawaii, 96814. This is it. Thank you. Uh, can you please state your current role with the Outdoor Circle? 
Uh, yeah, I'm executive director of the Outdoor Circle. Uh, it's a position I've held for uh, five and a half years. Um, I oversee the organization, uh, the statewide organization, and its many uh, branches throughout the islands, uh, which is a volunteer-led and managed board. So, and one of my positions is to represent the positions of the Outdoor Circle. Uh, I'd like to. I'm sorry, one of my responsibilities is to is to represent the positions of the Outdoor Circle. Thank you. I'd like to submit Mr. Welch as a representative of the Outdoor Circle. Okay, that's all right. Is it a request for qualification as an expert or just? Yes, no. a request to qualify him as an expert representative of the Outdoor Circle. Okay, any objections? No objections. <clears throat> Mr. Pang. Is there, is there specific categories that the Outdoor Circle has in terms of positions? Because um, I'm just trying to find out what area of expertise. I, mean, if I, I understand the request from Mr. Yoshimori is to be an expert about the Outdoor Circle as an organization, its history, and its positions. That's it. Um, if he, if uh, I, I don't have objection if he's if he's going to testify as a representative of uh, of the outdoor circle. Okay. Yeah, no objection from OP commissioners. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, um, Mr. Welch. Can you please describe the main objectives of the outdoor circle? Uh, okay, our, our main objectives are uh, working to keep Hawaii clean, green, and beautiful by preserving, protecting, and advocating for, and enhancing our environment, its natural and scenic views through our branches throughout the, all of the islands with five branches on Oahu. Uh, this includes protecting and planting trees, uh, protecting the visual environment, uh, and advocating for stewardship of the land and natural environment, protecting open space uh, to ensure that greenscapes and treescapes, uh, treescapes are preserved and enhanced to fight visual blight of our islands and to promote the work of our branches for their own initiatives in their own communities. Um, thank you. W what is the position of the outdoor circle on the petitioner's proposed cemetery expansion? In general, the outdoor circle policies oppose variances, exemptions, or land use changes that would result in reduction of open spaces and lands designated as preservation, conservation, or prime agricultural. Uh, we have concerns that any variance or change of the boundary will set precedent as well. And we have some significant concerns about this proposed boundary change from conservation to urban. Uh, we have some specific uh, points if you'd like me to go into those now. Can you please? Yeah, and I, I, I would refer to you as uh, Commissioner Okudo was mentioning uh, Hawaii Revised Statutes Chapter 205 on uh, what a conservation district is and what it includes. Uh, and I, I think it, it would, may bear some repeating, but uh, I'll skip to my uh, points here, which was um, first, this, this land was purchased with the understanding that it it was conservation land and nearby other property owners certainly based decisions for their purchases with this designation um, with incumbent properties and restrictions. Um, but our concerns include the following. One is the importance of maintaining the forested land and trees in this natural environment. Uh, cemetery turf and complete forest as we have now are not equal open spaces. Uh, for example, the, the FEIS notes no significant impact for uh, avifaunal species, but removing their entire habitat would seem completely detrimental by any measure. Uh, we heard that birds nor bats could no longer be expected to nest or rest in the cemetery versus the current natural landscape. <clears throat> in addition, this proposal destroys natural scenic beauty and mature trees uh, with their canopy coverage in a naturally formed landscape with trees providing um, the eco ser ecosystem service benefits that they do, including local cooling effects from the forest. 
Uh, we heard in testimony that this was an open green space and that it will remain an open green space. And I should use that in air quotes uh, after the project would be complete. But this is not open green space in the same sense as uh, what is being proposed. It's a heavily treed conservation land right now. That's different than, than turf. Uh, we heard in testimony that these trees will be replaced, but where will these trees be replaced and with what species and how many years would it be, decades would it be for the same uh, benefits to accrue? And they certainly wouldn't be accruing on the same property. <clears throat> uh, we heard here also, as far as visual planes, I'd like to read um, uh, from the FEIS. The project would not significantly impact the visual vividness, unity, or intactness of identified views. Now these views, uh, as an aside, these views were from, I think, 11 different areas. Um, back to the testimony. Although the project would alter the appearance of the petition area resulting from grading and landscaping improvements, significant visual impacts are not anticipated because the petition area is one of many elements collectively establishing the visual quality of the visible, visible landscape. The overall impression of the petition area would remain as open space. Therefore, changes to the visual character of one aspect of these views would not impact the overall visual quality of the views. Um, this is, um, it's, it's obvious that, that the, the visual impact will be dramatically um, altered. We would disagree with this. It's significant to destroy a hundred foot high mountain and all of the tall trees that are cur uh, currently on it. It will permanently and detrimentally impact a uh, visual quality of the landscape depending on the viewer's perspective. It may not be from certain views where it's below a point, but I was just driving down H3 looking at the proposed uh, land. It just happened to catch my eye and indeed the project would unalterable unalterably change the look and character of the current natural mountain and forest that exists today. If, if I may, Mr. Yes, sir. Yoshimori, actually, um, I, I wanna, you know, I think you do an incredible job as a pro se intervener and I wanna defer to this, but um, Mr. Welch's testimony is mostly seemingly right now about the EIS, which actually has been accepted. We've already been through that part of the proceedings. So can you give me a little direction on where we're trying to go with this particular witness, which is, who's being heard during the expert witness portion of these proceedings. I think we're, we're asking for the outdoor circles position on all of these different aspects um, related to the development. Um, I think Mr. Welch has maybe three more points to go and um, okay. I'd ask for indulgence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we also have concerns about potential uh, groundwater and uh, runoff into neighboring properties and into Kaneohe Bay. Uh, recent super uh, storms and water study models for rain bombs are throwing off planning and flooding plans uh, completely off if you witness Kauai, Hilo, or East Oahu just a couple of years ago. Uh, as we heard in testimony, uh, sediment during development above planned storm levels would not be able to be handled in the cap uh, in captured or captured in retention and detention basins. We had two witnesses who prevented very different peak flow scenarios from 173 cubic feet a second to 1,000 uh, uh, cubic feet a second. Even if the difference is explained by a smaller footprint standard, as one of the uh, witnesses testified, it's difficult to ascertain what may actually occur. Um, we're talking about a complete terraforming of the remaining land with over 470,000 cubic yards of mountains removed, repositioned, large, tall retaining walls and detention bases completely destroying the natural area in question. Um, as Commissioner Okuda had pointed out, uh, whether this material is trucked to the PVC landfill or uh, used in another building site or somehow held somewhere else, the movement of 50,000 cu plus cubic yards of dirt on city streets will undoubtedly have an impact on traffic. Um, I estimate based on 10 to 18 cubic yards per dump truck, that's between 2,700 and 5,000 one-way trips, so doubled up for the round trips that's hitting the surface roads. Um, we just heard from an a, a entomologist repeating that the Fish and Wildlife Service said that there would be an immediate detrimental effect 
and potential for long-term survival of the damselfly. Obviously, the petitioner is looking at some a very strong um, ways to protect that. But regarding stewardship, stewardship of the property owned by SMC uh, and the uh, Kauai Wai Heiau complex, current cultural practitioners are allowed access uh, to the Heiau on the property. There's nothing that would prevent um, HMP or uh, SMC from turning over this property to a local cultural partner in perpetuity or simply allow for current access as is right now. Um, or for that matter, they could put the proposed lands not under consideration for the project into a conservation easement with uh, Trust for Public Lands or Hawaii Island Land Trust or another uh, trust. Um, they could improve access to the Heiau. Um, they could gift areas in the current cemetery space for native Hawaiian traditional burials as well. So despite the many questions brought up surrounding specific terms for the cultural preserve, who would control it, how native burial plots would be allocated, uh, resolution of disputes concerning different groups or members, uh, funding of the land trust as brought up by the chair today, um, liability concerns and access. These could all be resolved by appropriate negotiations, um, resulting in this being put into a land trust today by SMC rather than connect it to any proposed expansion of the cemetery. This could be an, an, a measure of goodwill to the community. Similarly, as Dr. Montgomery had testified, as a good steward of the land, HMP might further uh, currently uh, work to protect and enhance the damselfly habitat by fencing the area from pigs, uh, which may also deter neighbors from throwing green rubbish. Um, they might also consider installing a water line as appropriate, uh, as we heard today from the uh, immediately uh, prior testifier. Um, but disconnect that action from any proposed action of a conservation boundary change request. What we recommend is, we wondered in the FEIS why alternative lands in option seven, which may exist on the island, which may not be as controversial or in such sensitive areas were not considered as alternatives for expansion. We understand that some people will choose burial, but we wonder if HMP would consider um, in its undeveloped land it currently has or unsold or perhaps repurchased plots, if they could be resized to allow for an increased burial density and plots or urns to be placed. We'd heard before in other testimony that up to 20 urns could be placed in each plot in other cemeteries. And HMP could also create more vaulted walls for urns like a punch bowl to allow family members to be memorialized near each other um, for the increasingly number of people who choose to be cremated. And finally, uh, HMP might uh, want to increasingly promote other so-called green burial options like a scattering garden or other emerging trends. We do understand that HMP and uh, SCI, I'm sorry, I was saying SMP, but SCI, um, have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to make a profit. They're legally required to do that. But we do not believe that the Land Use Commission should change the boundary district from its current status as conservation land. So, and uh, because we think that the cemetery should be able to continue to provide the services that they do, and it will not inhibit their ability to create a profit for their shareholders under the current existing boundaries. In summary, uh, transferring the community benefits of this current green, green treed space in the conservation district to one of an urban classification for uh, additional cemetery space is not in the best interest of the community. This land should stay in conservation district status undeveloped for perpetuity for the reasons above we do oppose any boundary amendment change. And I, I appreciate um, your indulgence in letting me uh, offer this testimony before the Land Use Commission. We realize this is a sensitive issue for many people. Uh, we appreciate the work of the Land Use Commission and the dedicated uh, work that you all do and for all the experts that have come before you. You're muted, Mr. Yoshimori. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Welch, for volunteering your time and your testimony today. Um, Mr. Welch is available to answer questions. Great, okay, we'll start out with the petitioner. Sure. Um, Mr. Welch, could you uh, give us your educational background starting with college, please? 
yes, I went to uh, the University of New Mexico and I got a bachelor's in economics and American studies. And I got my master's degree at uh, what is now a Thunderbird Graduate School of International Management, which is a, uh, I think they call it in a unit of uh, Arizona State University. Okay, did, did you take any uh, courses or minor in um, environmental conservation? No, I did not. And I'm not presenting myself as a, uh, a conservation or a specialist in entomology or water flow or anything like that. And could you, thank you. And can you give us uh, some of your professional history, your professional background, please? Uh, I have run, I ha I'm a certified association executive, uh, which is arguably more um, valuable than an MBA these days. Uh, it, I, my primary work at the Outdoor Circle is in running the organization and managing, uh, representing its positions uh, and that of its many branches. Uh, so uh, I testify often before the city council or uh, neighborhood boards, that sort of thing. Uh, I work with DNLR or city offices, uh, departments on a regular basis about uh, the exact issues um, like this, whether it involves uh, visual issues or tree issues, um, open space issues uh, on a daily basis. Uh, That's the majority of my work, I would say. Thank you. And what position did you hold? What job did you have before you became the executive director of the Outdoor Circle five and a half years ago? Uh, I was the executive director for probably, uh, I don't know, eight years or something for an organization called the World History Association, which was operated out of the University of Hawaii. It was a collection, it is a collection of uh, professors and teachers of the field of world history. Thank you. And prior to that position? <clears throat> prior to that position, I have, I ran, uh, as far as this, this line of work, the uh, uh, Hawaii Rainbow Film Festival for a number of years. And I've worked in other jobs that are not exactly related to this, um, including holding a real estate license. But that was in an alternate universe where I sold timeshare, which is not exactly related to um, this at all. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, you made some comments about our EIS. Um, I was just wondering, were you able to submit written comments to our draft EIS? Did I submit written comments to the draft EIS? It's been so long ago. I I remember testifying before this commission at the golf course uh, when it was uh, held over there. And honestly, I don't remember if I submitted a written testimony to this, but I I believe I did. I, I, maybe Grant, you remember uh, if I had submitted something? I don't, I, I don't recall offhand, but I'll. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Welch, um, is, is a part of the mission of the Outdoor Circle to promote conservation um, of Hawaii's environment? Would that be fair to say? I think that would be fair to say, yes. And for the purposes of promoting conservation, are you, uh, familiar with uh, a, what's called a conservation easement? Yes. And what is your, how, how did you gain that familiarity? I think I would hold an idea that most, your, your average Joe would hold. I'm not an attorney either, so, and I don't uh, pretend to be one, but it would be something that, that uh, a conservation e easement, I would say, goes with the uh, the covenant restrictions of the um, of the property. So if it's sold, that it it runs with the land. Thank you. And if you have an understanding, um, can you give us uh, your definition of the purpose of a conservation easement? I think it would be to. Uh, 
uh, protect the original um, intent of the current property owner that that intention uh, be legally codified for the in perpetuity, uh, no matter who the property is transferred to or sold in the future. Okay, perpetuity to do what? To follow the restrictions of the um, of the easement. And what what kind of restrictions have you seen, or are you aware of? Perhaps there would be a restriction, uh, a conservation easement that you're unable to build on a certain piece of property. It's turned over to a, a, a trust, for example, uh, that does not allow development to protect a view plane or to um, protect a, a watershed or uh, a sensitive environment. And so while it may be technically or legally able to be um, built upon under current law, if that is part of the conservation easement, that that then becomes the new understanding or rule that's passed down uh, that doesn't end unless it's released by a judge in the future. Thank you. Um, do you know if the outdoor circle is a party to any conservation easement? That's a good question. You know, the organization's 108 years old. I've been here for five. I don't, I'm not aware of any uh, responsibilities that I have to look over any conservation easements. And I think we would not become involved in that. I think if someone asked us to do that, we would turn to Hawaii Island Land Trust or the Trust for Public Land or a similar organization. Thank you. Do you have a opinion or belief that conservation easements are an effective tool to protect Hawaii's uh, environment? I think they're one part of, uh, of a way to protect something. Uh, first, we have our you know, basic uh, land use uh, ordinances. Um, and certainly, in, it's, a, it's an additional, it's part of a toolbox to protect something. So I would say yes, uh, that they uh, could, should, are valuable tools to protect um, land. Thank you. Uh, I have no more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Tabata. Um, County. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. My name is Dwayne Pang. I represent the city and county of Honolulu. I just want to go uh, over the decision-making um, procedures for the outdoor circle with respect to this particular project. Was this uh, um, presented to the board of directors? I believe that it was. We did. Um, we, when a, a branch may ask us to take up a certain <clears throat> uh, issue that is important for it. And so one of our windward branches or both of our windward branches uh, brought this to us and allowed us to, uh, and asked us to uh, make this a state level issue, but it is also completely in line with our policies um, that are on our homepage of the website. And with respect to the points that you uh, um, testified to, were all of those points approved by the uh, board of directors? No. I'm authorized to speak on behalf of them and uh, hopefully have not misrepresented any concerns or positions of the outdoor circle. So the, the, the testimony that you presented today was not presented to the board of directors uh, before you testified? No, and in general, uh, my testimony is never, uh, I am assumed to speak for the outdoor circle uh, I have never submitted my testimony in advance for um, approval by the board. So you're not sure whether the board uh, um, supports the testimony that you submitted today? I think you could say it's fair to say that I represent the position of the outdoor circle in this matter and that every 
that every testimony that I have, because I do a lot, is not gone over by the board. I am entrusted with representing the position of the outdoor circle. And that, the, that, this, that this testimony would be consistent with the board's wishes. If you're asking if I did, do I submit my written testimony to the board for approval for anything, the, the, the answer is no, I don't. But the board has complete availability to watch me on TV, to read testimony that I give. Uh, there's ample uh, time for them to come back and uh, give any comments, but I have not had any. Uh, I, that, uh, I assume that because there has never been any objection to how I present the outdoor circle that I am representing the outdoor circle and its official positions. Um, in your, in your, uh, in the intervenors exhibit four, it says organizational status the ED, and I'm assuming that you, is responsible for continue, continuing pursuing the aims and goals of the organization and defined by the board of directors. Yes, and so this testimony would be consistent with that work. But it was never presented to the board. Is, your, is that your testimony? That's correct. Okay. I, I, I think he's answered the questions three times. Yes, I have Actually, nothing further. Thank you. Planning. No questions. Commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Ohigashi, you had your hand raised earlier. I don't know if that was intentional or... Commissioner Ohigashi? I'm, uh, I thought I wanted to ask a question, but I'm thinking so yet. Okay. Um, Commissioner Sokuda followed by <clears throat> Commissioner Chang. Thank you, Commissioner much. Giovanni. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Welch, for your testimony. Um, and I apologize. I was going to try to cite to a specific exhibit, but I frankly can't find it. The exhibit was a memorandum of understanding uh, between Hawaiian Memorial Park and uh, the Koalaupoko uh, Hawaiian Civic Club. In preparation for your testimony, did you see or review that memorandum of understanding? I have not. Um, do you know the the history and the length of time the Kolaupoko Hawaiian Civic Club has been involved in cultural matters on the windward side? Uh, I could not give you a specific uh amount of time, but I would say quite a while. In formulating the outdoor circles position, whether it's the position of your board of directors or you personally, did the outdoor circle uh, consult with or talk to anyone who was a member of the Koalaupoko Hawaiian Civic Club? Not to my knowledge. As far as which organization would be in a better position to give testimony about the preservation of uh, cultural sites in this uh, or on this subject property, who would have in your mind better knowledge uh, about uh, what might be culturally appropriate regarding uh, the site? the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club or the Outdoor Circle? Uh, I wouldn't presume to uh, uh, say that the Outdoor Circle has anything, any uh, standing on how uh, it should involve cultural matters or, or on uh, the uh, actual management of this site uh, with respect to traditional Hawaiian practices. And I thought that uh, you've had some excellent uh, Witness, uh, witnesses before uh, on how that might happen. I think there were a number of very good questions that were brought up as far as how that might be executed. But uh, in those cases, I would defer to uh, 
the Kola Poco or, or, the, or, or other civic clubs. And I realize that they may not be always um, in lockstep with each other as well. Well, one of the things we have to do in a quasi-judicial format is basically weigh or determine the weight of evidence uh, or how much weight we give testimony or evidence presented by various witnesses. Who should we give more weight to as far as how cultural sites or cultural resources should be managed on the specific site? Should we give more weight to the uh, views of the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club or should we give more weight to the outdoor circle? I would defer to, uh, to whatever um, traditional caretakers uh, have to say about this issue, about how they would want it managed and how they view appropriate ability to, um, to manage this, this area and what's important for them. Our, yes. So in other words, if, and I'm just saying if this were the case, I'm not saying it actually is, but if the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club had, has taken a position that the benefits that are being presented with respect to cultural resources on the property would be more enhanced by allowing the development of the cemetery with conditions to proceed forward, the outdoor circle would defer to the Kola Poco Hawaiian Civic Club. Is that your testimony? I would say that, uh, not exactly. I would say that, as, in, as I just had said, I believe that uh, the cemetery could very well make these same improvements and give uh, all of the things that they're offering to the Civic Club separate and apart from any boundary amendment changes. So it does not need to be connected. They could give that right now. They could improve access. They could um, fund it as a good steward, as a good neighbor. So I would say that they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, our in I understand what you're trying to, uh, to get at here, that it's like a balancing of better, but I don't know that it's either or. I think it, it may be both and that we can um, protect the conservation district and have a more robust and protected and funded and managed uh, cultural preserve. Do you disagree with the way I was interpreting some of the testimony from the witnesses of the Office of Planning that frankly, there is no affirmative duty by an owner of conservation designated property to affirmatively protect cultural or environmental resources on the property. In other words, it might be immoral, but I could just benignly neglect uh, the resources or the species on the property. As long as there's no active take or active uh, uh, deconstruction of a heiau or other resources. Do you, do, you, do you agree that that's a fair statement? Based on your questioning and the uh, the answers from the witnesses, I would I would agree that is a fair understanding of my of what, of what I understand as well. A fair, I would agree. Yes. So uh, let me ask you this, and this is my final question. So why isn't the trade off here worth it to get protection of uh, a conservation easement, cultural resources? Uh, an endangered species, why isn't that trade-off worth what Hawaiian Memorial Park is asking for? Why wouldn't that trade-off not be in the community interest? Well, does it need to be a trade-off? It would be my response. Do we have to um, destroy a, a mountain and move massive amounts of dirt and, uh, and, and uproot an entire ecosystem so that we can have a cultural preserve and the, the dam supply habitat protected. Why doesn't the property owner currently step up and do that as a good steward and community um, leader? 
while also protecting the land. I don't think it's necessarily um, something that it's not an either or. Okay, well, Mr. Welch, I, that was my question. I heard your answer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no further questions. Thank you, Commissioner Okuda. Um, Commissioner Chang, then Giovanni, then Ohigashi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Welch. I just have a couple of questions. Um, so based upon the questioning from the, the city, so is it the business practice of the outdoor circle not to submit official letters um, on their letterhead reflecting their position, but rather to have you testify at these different hearings? I, I do both. And so I may, uh, honestly, my, my memory is not what it used to be. I may have submitted something for this. Uh, I do uh, like you all an incredible amount of work. And it's uh, for this one, I do remember testifying at the, at the golf course. But um, I regularly submit written testimony uh, on various uh, topics before um, boards or uh, commission committees or uh, in front of the outdoor circle or to uh, private entities, developers, um, and so forth. And I also provide oral testimony. It depends on my schedule, my ability. Um, you know, sometimes it's just a, it's a time issue um, as well. So um, if we went through the record in this case, would we find your testimony on Outdoor Circle Letterhead if you submitted one? If I submitted it, it would be on Outdoor Circle Letterhead. Um, have you ever been to the cultural site? Um, I haven't because I wanted to respect that it is on private land. And um, I have uh, driven through the cemetery and I've, I have seen the photos from the testimony that's been uh, presented to you. But um, that I, I, I also would like to respect uh, private property and also that um, I don't have any particular business there. Okay. Um, do you know whether the landowner and the Ko'ola Poko Hawaiian Civic Club um, um, do you know whether the, the Ko'ola Poko Hawaiian Civic Club actually does access the site and um, you know, takes care of the site with the landowners? Do you know whether that's true or not? Do I know whether, I'm sorry, can you say it again? Yeah, yeah. do you know whether, because you said um, you don't have to do this petition. To, the landowner could actually enter into an agreement with the Ko'ola Poko Hawaiian Civic Club to to steward the land, to enter into a grave. So do you know whether the Ko'ola Poko Hawaiian Civic Club actually accesses the site right now? If they, if they, what's the last? Yeah. Do you know whether they access it? Because you, oh, the impression if, they I asked, got, if they asked for it, is that what you're saying? I'm asking you, do you know whether they access the site with the land, um, with an understanding from the landowner? No, I'm unaware of any discussions uh, at all uh, between Kola Poco uh, Civic Club or and and the cemetery, except for the testimony provided um, here. Okay. So your your statement about they could do, they they don't need the boundary amendment. They actually could do this right now. That you're just you're saying that as a matter of generalities. You don't know whether they're currently engaged in some kind of a correct game. okay correct um and the last the last question i have for you was a very interesting statement you made at the beginning which was certainly um the cemetery they knew that this was conservation land and then you said certainly the residential owners based their decision knowing that these purchased the land because these were conservation lands. How do you know that? Well, if, okay, most, I would say, let me say most certainly. If I am buying a, a piece of property and I'm buying it on what appears to be conservation land, I would ask my realtor, what is this back here? And the realtor would say, that's conservation land. Right. And I would assume that conservation land is not going to become a cemetery. 
Well, I'm, I guess I'm not, I'm not asking what you would do because you made a statement. Um, certainly the residential owners based their, deci their decision because it was, they were purchasing their house because these were conservation lands. So I'm asking you, how do you personally know that? Okay, uh, that's, it's, it's, it's a valid point. I don't know. I haven't surveyed every property owner, okay. and uh, okay. but I would assume that, um, that that would have been a factor in the purchase of their property, just like it's a factor you maybe want to be near a good school or a shopping mall or whatever, that people buy property based on certain characteristics of uh, the neighborhood. So I would assume that it would be there, but I have no certainty in knowing. So thank you for correcting that. Could it possibly be an assumption that they bought the property because there was a cemetery there and not a development? Uh, uh, that they bought it because there was a cemetery? Right. Well, uh, in the, this property in question, is there's not a cemetery there. So um, is that what you, I'm, yeah, I'm no, sorry, I'm not no, understanding. The, cemetery, exactly. the cemeteries around is around this property. It's not too far away from the property. So, right. Yes. Right. So yeah, for somebody, for some of the houses, they abut exactly against the cemetery. And those folks knew when they bought the property, that's a cemetery right there. So that also factors into their their decisions and they're they're okay with it or they're not. So do you think they might have bought the property because it, there was a cemetery? Some might have if there was a cemetery right there. Yeah, Okay. certainly. All right, thank you very much for your answers. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Chang. Commissioner Giovanni. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for your testimony, Mr. Welch, representing the outdoor circle. Does the outdoor circle have a stated policy on climate change or greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, our policy, let me just read that to you. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, I can say probably not anything specific, but as far as climate change, um, we do have a policy that we, uh, I would, refer you to our website under policy positions um, and the statements below that. But I would say that um, we talk about carbon footprint and the need to limit uh, damaging effects uh, of climate change. We talk about um, our carbon neutrality challenge, the need for uh, canopy coverage uh, to absorb uh, rainfall, minimize runoff. So I would say that probably somewhere in there without looking specifically that we would tie can't tree, trees to uh, climate change. Is it fair to say that it's affirmative that the outdoor circle does have a published or accessible policy on climate change? Yes, that okay. is true. So we heard testimony from the petitioner from their expert witnesses, I believe it was their arborist, that it was an opinion that due, for, due to the tree for tree replacement um, that the petitioner was committed to doing, the opinion of the expert was that the net effect on climate change would not be material. Would you have a scientifically, would the outdoor circle have a scientifically based uh, opinion that would agree or disagree with the opinion that's been expressed by the petitioner's expert? We don't have any scientific opinion on that, but I think that uh, we, we've we signed on to uh, various things. It's uh, uh, the global climate, I'm looking online, global climate change initiative um, that recognizes uh, that trees are a very effective way to mitigate climate change. And as far as the idea of the tree removal and planting some trees elsewhere, so let's just say you have 10 trees that are this thick and they're exactly replanted 10 trees that thick, um, 10 miles away. Um, I mean, then you're, you're changing an apple for an apple, but that's not what we're, we're looking at because those trees that have grown there uh, are mature, healthy trees and large trees uh, by far have a much greater um, uh, positive effect with ecosystem service benefits than a newly planted tree. I mean, it's just, it's common sense, but it, not to everybody because the city, it's 
does also do the one for one exchange, but we have to realize you have to factor in then another 30 or 40 years before that tree may reach maturity. So that's your personal opinion and it's not a scientifically based opinion of the outdoor source. No, I, I think it's commonly held scientific knowledge that a large mature tree uh, provides many more ecosystem service benefits than a newly planted tree. I think without, without question, as far as water absorption, uh, cooling effects, uh, uh, carbon, sequest uh, carbon sequestration, I don't think that that's in question. So back to my original question, would you, in your opinion, representing the outdoor circle, would you agree or disagree with the opinion expressed by the petitioners in the matter of whether or not their tree for tree replacement program and commitment would result in over time, no material change on the carbon footprint and climate change effects. I'm sorry, kid, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Can you repeat that last part? Would you agree or disagree with the position, the, the opinion that was offered by the expert for the petitioner that as a result of the tree for tree exchange program, there would not be a material effect on climate change as a result of this project? Um, I would qualify that and say I would disagree in that in the, in the initial years, there would certainly be a change because you're taking large health uh, mature trees and planting them with saplings. Over time, in uh, 50 years, it may be that the uh, that it balances out. Um, so, yeah. So my question was, would it, would it be material? The opinion was it would not, they acknowledge that there would be the time effect. But over, just as you did, they expressed that it would neutralize itself and it would not, on, over time, it would not be a material effect. And that's what I'm asking, whether you would agree or disagree with that. I would, uh, that over time, I would agree that, I, I mean, the, the issue of climate change is very complex and, and has a lot of controversy for it. And that, um, you know, when we're looking at, it, it, this is often brought up, people don't want a tree cut down and they, they do point to climate change. And they say, well, this, this one tree is not gonna make a difference. We can plant these other ones. They're gonna have that benefit after a while. And so it's a, it's a cumulative effect, I think that we really look at there and that this is sort of a, uh, emblematic on a, on a small scale of what we're really looking at as a larger community. So as a matter of policy, <clears throat> the outdoor circle operating in Hawaii, isn't it a matter of fact that in many cases, uh, the outdoor circle has endorsed the approach of tree for tree replacements when in fact a tree needed to be removed for one reason or another associated with development? You know, I think the general uh, replacement is three for one. So at, for every tree that's taken out, three should be planted. Um, obviously, you know, in some places, uh, and that's just because our city has lost so much canopy coverage. We're down to about 20, 20% or so now. Um, and that's in the urban areas. It's not including the, the proposed area. Um, but in our, in our urban areas, and obviously you can only have so many trees in one space uh, shading a, a, a sidewalk, but the idea is to increase the overall canopy, not to do a one for one exchange, but to actually increase what we're looking at. So, uh, and, and, and given that when a mature tree is cut down, you lose so much of its value uh, that a one for one is not an equal comparison for decades. Thank you, I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Giovanni. Commissioner Ohigashi. So, so Mr. Welch, uh, you're an expert in the area of outdoor circle policy matters. Is that right? I would say that I represent the outdoor circle in its policies and positions, yes. 
And you're not here to testify as an engineer, nor are you here to testify as an ophthalmologist, nor as a conservate or a, an expert in an arborist or any other type of scientific field. Is that right? Correct, or legal field. So what I understand you to be is your testimony is an argument made by the interveners in this matter. And I will be probably treating it as that, as such. And therefore I don't have any more questions to ask you. I, I would say that we are, our position is one of advocate for uh, the natural and scenic beauty of Hawaii. Uh, and that is what Outdoor Circle is often called upon to testify in. Anything else, commissioners? Any other hands up for Mr. Welch? Commissioner Cabral. Yes, thank you very much for the information. Um, I'm trying to put all these pieces together. And um, Mr. Welch, thank you for coming in and working with us on this. So am I hearing you that you're suggesting that the um, cemetery company should in fact go ahead and make the improvements and provide the access for the cultural site um, and not, not, not expand their cemetery site? So if you're, is, does that mean that you're willing that they should to make that access available? if necessary, that they would make land movement changes to put in an access road from their current cemetery site as planned to make access for the cultural site? Are you suggesting that, that it's okay to make the changes for the cultural site? If, if that would, in order, like you said, to be a good neighbor, are you acceptable if, if the roadways or the whatever were to be done in order to um, promote the cultural site? Well, I wouldn't want to uh, prescribe any specific uh, measures that the cemetery might take. I'm just saying that they could take that. It might be a footpath in there that's that's uh, that's well maintained on from a higher ground. Um, it may be uh, just uh, leaving it as is, but but creating an easement uh, or that could be held in trust. Um, what is specifically done or even requested is um, I don't know, and uh, I. I I wouldn't want to say because it's uh, it's for the people that use that land for traditional cultural practices, but having it preserved by the cemetery and enhanced as those folks, as they have talked about doing, um, if they got this land use done, if they did that without doing that, I think that would be being a really great uh, corporate citizen and a neighbor and steward of the land, uh, the same way about putting a you know high fence to keep the damselfly area from pigs. Uh, so I don't think that um, that they need to be granted uh, any any variance in the conservation district to do that. I think they could do that just because they're a good landowner and steward. Well, I'm not sure about that because they'd have to be making alterations and so that might still come before us. But my second question to you is that you've indicated that you represent the outdoor circle. You're their current president. So since this project's been going on for a, a long time period, um, at, but you did not indicate that your board of directors actually knew or had, had um, observed or reviewed your, your position or your testimony, um, but that they agree with you. So because this project's been going on so long, have you in fact ever had a meeting with your board or your membership and have they ever voted, taken a vote to take this stand? Or is that you're just sure because that you guys all think alike that it's okay that the, you're representing that the outdoor circle has, has taken this stand? Um, I, our concerns are, and, and my testimony is based on our policies uh, which is what I, I would go off of, uh, as well as my history of the organization. I also consult uh, various leaders inside of the organization, and I give regular updates uh, on a monthly or bi-monthly basis to my board for them to review or ask any questions about uh, the various testimonies that I give for boards or committees. 
um, and the like. So this has been before the board for a while and uh, I think it's fair to say that this is the position of the outdoor circle and it reflects the will of the board as well as that of the local branches in the area. Okay, thank you. And then uh, thank you too. I, I'm in Hilo, so green is our color when it's not raining. And um, was one, I'm interesting that you're saying it's uh, three trees for one because it, I um, have done a number of times I've had this policy of one for one. I did not know that we've increased that to three. So, um, and I have um, had conversations with members of the outdoor circle here in Hilo. So thank you for that updated information. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, anything further? Um, I, I have a few comments with the commission's indulgence. I'd like to do my questioning so that we can be done with Mr. Welch's <clears throat> testimony prior to lunch break, if that's okay. Um, Mr. Welch, I, I don't, ha as, as somebody who served on a nonprofit board, I don't have any problems with the fact that sometimes our executive directors write testimony on their own. Um, without fully consulting the board on the exact wording or the exact version of the testimony. I don't doubt that um, this is your testimony in part because actually on October 28th, you commented on the DEIS, Thank essentially you. restating uh, 2018. It's in the final EIS. Okay, you commented you. in opposition to this as well as individual testimony provided by your board chair and one of your branches. So we but, have okay, three pieces of testimony from outdoor. Yeah. Okay. But so, my problem, actually, one of my problems is that under Hawaii's environmental review law, if you testify or if you offer comments on a DEIS and the final EIS comes out and you do not feel your comments were addressed, you actually have 30 days by which to bring suit against the adequacy of the EIS. And this is something that the Outdoor Circle, to my knowledge, has actually done repeatedly in the past over inadequate 343 documents. But you guys did not bring suit against the adequacy of this EIS, did you? Not to my knowledge. Did you contest the EIS acceptance when we, cons when we accepted it? Not to my knowledge. So why do you come now and say the EIS is flawed? I see certain things inside of the EIS, EIS uh, the, the FEIS, and wanted to give our position on this, as well as um, what we believe is maybe some inconsistencies with how, uh, maybe, and to reiterate our testimony um, more clearly before the board. But the Outdoor Circle's belief in the inadequacy of the EIS was not to such a degree that you sought to invalidate it. That's correct. Okay. Um, during one of the many hearings we've held on this matter, um, there was some chuckling in the audience when a, a resident, I believe, of Pohainani talked about the need to preserve this forest of beautiful invasive trees. She might have said beautiful alien trees and the audience sort of chuckled. But essentially, that's the argument that you're making, right? Even though this is acknowledged in the EIS as a degraded, non-native invasive forest, you want to see it protected. Well, I As think that in that state, if it's uh, I, I, we won't say it's degraded, but if we're talking about the the natives versus non natives issue, it's a huge issue, and we would have to remove most trees. I think under twenty five hundred feet in the state, if we were going to go with all native trees, so it's a, it's a complex issue. And if we are going back and replanting with sandalwood and uh, all types of native species all around the islands, it's a it's a massive undertaking, which I don't think the Outdoor Circle would oppose. But at this point, uh, we support current forested canopy trees as much as possible. I mean, there's some that are that are invasive uh, in a way like uh, I mean, you could see um, the Albizias. Um, they're, they, they snap off. They uh, can be hazards over the roadways. There's certain trees that are more, I guess, invasive or, or worse than others. But uh, taking down all the trees, it's the same. It's the same argument about lowland shade trees. For example, the monkey pods, you know, native of Central America. Um, we have 
a huge majority of our of our trees, I think it's over 70% in Honolulu, are actually monkey pod trees that are providing that that huge shade. I, I hope we never get hit with a with a uh, you know an insect that destroys the monkey pods. But the reality is is there are no good lowland shade canopy trees that would um, give that sort of coverage. So while this topic does come up, um, we don't take the non-native versus native um, argument uh, uh, in this in this context. But but in this case, actually, the trees, many of the trees to be removed are Albizia, correct? If some of them were to be removed and be replanted, I don't think that the outdoor circle would have a problem with that. But destroying a mountain and replacing it with turf are entirely, and replanting trees with native uh, coverage are different issues. Um, so I just want to be last bit of questioning. Um, the Ko'olau Poco Hawaiian Civic Club and other Native Hawaiian organizations have supported this project and testified in favor, promoting in both the cultural practices as well as their understanding of the conservation goals. But the environmental, the outdoor circle is opposing this project. Yes. Um, but offering an alternative, which is for the landowner to do that same good deed for the civic club in a different way. Um, the, perhaps not a realistic alternative. Perhaps, but um, it's possible. Okay, I have nothing further. Do you have any redirect, Mr. Yoshimori? Well, I do not. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Okay, so it is 1221. I'd like to reconvene at one o'clock, if that's possible, 39 minutes for a fairly brief lunch, and then we proceed on with Mr. Yoshimori's witnesses. Mr. Yoshimori, who is your next witness? Next witness is Mr. Nathan Ewan. Okay, um, we will bring in Nate after... Um, the break, if you can be ready a couple minutes before, that would be even better. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Welch, and we are in recess. Mr. Chair, what time again? One o'clock. One o'clock. Thank you. Mr. Chair, we're also checking to see if our other witnesses are ready, if they're not. Um, Please, thank you. Mr. Middleton's Mr. not available. Thank you, Mr. Ishimori. I'm awaiting your direction, Mr. Yoshimori. Okay, um, Mr. Hayam is available to testify. Can we promote him, please? Sure. Let me um, move out, Mr. Middleton, and move in, Mr. John Hayam. Yes, please. Mr. Hyam, when you 
to reflect that most of it is not graded. Um, if, if none of it was graded, the coefficient would be 0.35. So by assuming a lower runoff coefficient, they're uh, underestimating the amount of post-development runoff. And if you make those two corrections, then it would virtually eliminate the calculated reduction in the post-development runoff rate and reduce the reduction in the volume from 5.5% to something less than 2.9%. <clears throat> um, I, I would also like to note that these are theoretical calculated figures, not necessarily the actual runoffs, as I will address further later, later on in the testimony. And although these changes are small, I thought it was important to point out because the report implies a reduction in runoff due to the proposed development that probably isn't the case. In fact, as I will mention later in my testimony, if the plate six method is used to calculate runoff, the runoff could be five times what has been calculated via the rational method. I think we're done with that figure. Um, do you have concerns with the proposed detention and or detention slash retention basins? Uh, I do. <clears throat> First, there is not enough information to determine what is really being proposed. On page 515 of the EIS, there is a description of three proposed detention basins. It lists the size of the basins as an area in square feet, but there is no indication of the volume of detention that each basin will have, which is the critical metric for a detention basin. Two of the three proposed basins appear to be located on the side of the lower hills, just above the residential area. This will re require a lot of excavation to create a basin on the side of a hill and greatly reduce the potential volume of detention that can be provided due to the area that will be lost in the cut slopes around the majority of the perimeter. And the two that, I, that are in not the best of places is the one on the upper right side um, at the end of Lipalu Street. The, the, contours line, the, the contour lines that you see cutting across it, the dark ones are every 10 feet and the lighter lines are every two feet. So there's a grade change of almost 30 feet across that detention basin. So ideally you pick a level place where you can dig a depression and create a basin. This one has 30 foot of change, elevation change from one end to the other. It's gonna be very, very difficult to create that basin. The other one is at the end of the short cul-de-sac near where it says proposed wall A. The same thing is true there's about 20 foot of elevation change between one, the bottom and the top. So you're, you're basically, again, constructing it on a hillside. Um, the irony of both of these basins is that there are nearby existing natural gullies that could have been used that would have required much less excavation and been able to provide much more detention volume in the same amount of area, but they are currently being proposed to be filled. And Grant, if you can go back to the first one, the just below the first basin, no, I'm same figure, sorry. No, yeah. So the, the basin proposed at the end of Lopalo Street, just below it, there's some V-shaped contour lines that are very close together, that area right there. 
that's a natural gully that's directing water down towards the street. That area, you could dig out a little bit, hollow it out a little bit more, and it would be an easy place for a detention basin, but it's being proposed to, to be filled so that they can get recover more land to be used. I mean, that part makes sense, but it's a shame to see that natural feature being lost. And the same thing is true of the other basin. Just below that, between wall A and wall B, that's a natural gully, a um, little above that grant and just there, right there. That, that area is where you see the contour lines curve around. That's a natural gully that's taking the water down towards that existing basin and would have been a much easier place for a detention basin. But again, that's, that would conflict with their, the rest of their grading plan. So they've put it here. And these, I should point out that these basins, all three of them are right now outside of the, the limits of grading. So there's no way to, for me to look at it and see how they would propose to make them into a detention basin because there's no information on how they would be graded. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is um, in both chapters two and five of the EIS, it refers to detention basins in other places in the same chapters, it refers to retention slash detention basins. There are references to runoff being retained and allowed to infiltrate, but there's no real information on how much permanent retention and how much detention will actually be provided at each of the three permanent basins. In the preliminary engineering report on page 20 and 24, it indicates a portion of the temporary sediment basins will be converted to the permanent uh, BMPs, these three basins, and that it is anticipated an additional 12,700 cubic feet of storage from the permanent basins will be achieved. I always get a little worried when I hear words of anticipated because it, what if they aren't able to reach what they anticipate? Are they, do they just settle for whatever they can achieve? Um, but um, to give you um, a perspective on this, the, the pre-development runoff in the table in the preliminary engineering report for this site is about 110 cubic feet per second. Cubic feet per second. It's a hard thing to get a picture of, but if you convert it to gallons per minute, which we're probably more familiar with, that's about 6,300 gallons per minute is the runoff from this entire site under the precondition pre-development condition. So the 12,700 cubic feet of anticipated storage could be filled up in as little as two minutes. So that's not a whole lot of detention given the amount of runoff. So without detailed information on the volumes of each of the three permanent basins, it is impossible to determine what risks of flooding the downstream homeowners may be exposed to. In, in summary, <clears throat> two of the three proposed detention basins appear to be in locations not well suited for detention basins. And also there's not enough detail of the proposed basins, no information on the capacity and little or no distinction as to how the basins will function via the detention or retention. I just want to clarify that um, you had said that the currently planned detention retention basins could possibly fill within two minutes. Is that correct? Yeah, theoretically. Um, the, the runoff 
the, the 110 roughly cubic feet per second doesn't happen with the first drops of rain. There's a thing called time of concentration that until all the water, all the rain that hits the farthest piece of land can run to the detention basin or the outlet area, the initial, I guess what I'm saying is the initial runoff is, is low because you're just getting the immediate area. And then as time progresses and more and more area the, or the rainfall hitting more and more area reaches the, the outlet, if the flow increases until you hit the time of concentration where all of the project is now reaching that point. And at that point, that's the point where there's 6,300, 6, excuse me, I I'm, said gallons per minute, it's cubic feet per minute. I was incorrect there. So 6,300 cubic feet per minute is the flow rate at the, when everything is hitting the, uh, the outlet area. And, and okay. for this site, that time of concentration is over 50 minutes. So long before you hit this peak flow, those basins are gonna be filled up and it will act as if they're not there. Every gal gallon or cubic feet of water that goes into them will go out through the overflow. So yeah, they're, they're just not very big. Thank you. Um, do you have any concerns with the conclusions proposed drainage improvements of the preliminary engineering report as it relates to the proposed grading and drainage improvements? I, I do. Um, <clears throat> earlier in a previous meeting, uh, during uh, Ms. Hirota's testimony, she referenced a portion of my written testimony about the use of plate six for the drainage calculations. And I thought it might be helpful if I took a moment to provide a little background on that. First, I, I'd like to commend Ms. Hirota on the preliminary engineering report that she prepared. It, it is a difficult site and with a couple of exceptions, which I have covered earlier, I think she did a great job calculating the runoff using what's called the rational method for areas up to 100 acres. And, and I also agree with Ms. Hirota that the plate six graph that I mentioned, which is contained in the drainage standards, is intended to be used for drainage areas of 100 acres or more. That said, because the two drainage calculation methods are totally different, the calculated runoff from a project that has 101 acres using plate six would be approximately five times the calculated runoff from a project that has 99 acres using the so-called rational method. As a result, there is a disconnect bet between the two methods near the transition size of 100 acres. In reality, there would be little difference in the actual runoff between a 99 acre site and a 101 acre project in the same area. The difference is that plate six method is intended to be more conservative because it deals with larger areas, often which are undeveloped and or steep. The rational method is intended to be used to design drainage improvements in smaller areas and generally flatter areas that are being subdivided and are developed usually with roads that would be dedicated to the city. The, the rational method uses nice smooth rainfall contours running around the island, assuming every storm hits the entire island somewhat evenly with increasing run, run, excuse me, increasing rainfall amounts as the ground elevation gets higher. As we've often seen, storm events, even of the same period and duration can be very different. Some impact the entire island somewhat evenly as assumed in the drainage standards. Other storms impact 
some areas much harder than others, such as in the 2018 Ina Haina storm or the 2004 Manoa storm. My point is that the calculation of stormwater runoff is not an exact science. The actual runoff can vary significantly from the calculated runoff, even though the calculated even though calculated using the accepted standards. The petition area looks and acts more like a steep, undeveloped area, the kind of area that plate six was intended for, than a fairly small, flatter area being developed into a subdivision for which the rational method was intended. I think the grading of the petition area poses more flooding risks to the downstream residential area than as accounted for in the rational method that was used. When I look at the big picture, I try to look at whether the risks, risks to existing developments are sufficiently minimized from the proposed project. If a project is seeking a discretionary approval to extensively grade a relatively steep area, not quite 100 acres, directly upstream of an existing residential area that already experiences flooding, should that project do more than just the minimum re required by the less conservative rational method? Would it be appropriate at a minimum to require, require projects in those situations to increase the proposed size of their detention retention basins, not only to help solve an existing problem, but to help ensure that they do not contribute to making the existing problem worse when that randomly concentrated storm occurs. Thank you. Um, would you mind recapping your concerns, please? Sure. First, I, I've identified two corrections that I believe should be made to the preliminary engineering report, which would virtually eliminate the calculated reduction in post-development runoff rate and reduce the reduction in volume by approximately half, <clears throat> which is to say that there would be little, if any, reduction in the, in the calculated post-development runoff. Secondly, there is insufficient information provided about the proposed retention detention basins to determine what is being proposed and whether or not it is sufficient to protect the downstream homes. And thirdly, I believe that a project seeking a discretionary approval to extensively grade a relatively steep area, not quite 100 acres, upstream of an existing residential area that already experiences flooding should do more than just the minimum required by the less conservative rational method. I think they should be required to increase the size of their anticipated 12,700 cubic feet permanent basins by five times to an actual minimum of 63,500 cubic feet. Factoring all these things into consideration, I believe this project as currently proposed puts downstream homeowners at an increased risk when a large or concentrated storm hits the area. Thank you, Mr. Hyam. Thank you so much for volunteering all of your time to do that detailed analysis and also your testimony today. Um, Mr. Hyam is available for questions. Okay, if you could stop the screen sharing for now, Mr. Yoshimori. We'll start with the petitioner. Chair, uh, Chair, may I uh, be able to use the share screen function, please? Yes, go ahead. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Hayam. Um, Good afternoon. I'm, look, I'm looking right now, or we are looking right now at your written testimony. And this is, uh, uh, this is basically what you just testified to, I believe. Um, and we are looking at page two of your written testimony. Okay. And what I'm looking at is the paragraph, well, the retention detention basin paragraph where you talk about, and I'm, I'm using my cursor here, where you say that the drainage areas, the drainage area A, okay, which is 2.3 acres <coughs> into the tributary in its existing condition, which we think is incorrect, okay? And just to go back and show, where A is, I'm now referring to figure 2.4, which is in the uh, preliminary engineering report, which is attached to the final EIS, which is exhibit six, and the PER is appendix D to the FEIS, just for the record. Right. So, so Area A is down here in the, I believe that's the, the south area. And you say that it's incorrect to include that in our, in our existing, existing runoff calculations. Is that correct? It is incorrect to include it in the pre-development runoff calculations. That is correct. Now, isn't it, but isn't it correct, Mr. Haim, that we are required to calculate all of the runoff from our project area, isn't that? I'm not sure I understand your question, but you, you can't include this in your runoff in the pre-development scenario and then compare that number to a post-development runoff number it's like apples and oranges. You're, you're saying this is included in the total pre-development and after development, the hilltop is gone. So area A drains the opposite way. It doesn't drain into the cemetery any longer. It drains upward in this figure because the hilltop that makes it run towards the cemetery is no longer there and the ground, the slope of the ground reverses, and it, it does, in the post-development condition, drain into the petition area. But you can't include it now and then compare it to a number later where it does go that way, because it's, it's just not, it's literally apples to oranges. So is it your testimony that the only runoff that we need to calculate is runoff that flows into the petition area? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it's not accurate to include it in the pre-development runoff and compare it to a number in the post-development scenario where it does flow into that number. It, it effectively overstates the pre-development runoff it, it makes it act like 110 cubic feet is running down into these various inlets when in fact it's not. It runs somewhere else entirely. So then, because the, the report later concludes there's a 4% reduction because its starting point, 110 CFS, includes area A, but area A doesn't go into the same basin that it does afterwards. I see. So your testimony therefore is, we are overstating our existing runoff. Is that correct? Let me clarify. 
you are overstating the existing runoff going to the downstream basins served by this project, the four uh, basins that I walked through earlier. Okay, thank you. Now, let us turn back to your written testimony and go to page three. And at the top of page three, you discuss um, approximately 9.7 acres of undisturbed area. And I believe what you're saying here is that there should be, an, well, what it says is, however, there should be another 9.7 acres of undisturbed area, which is a buffer area area D highlighted in red, and I assume partly near the cultural preserve, area E2. If the additional 9.7 acres are corrected as undisturbed, it increases the post-development runoff volume. Did I read that correctly, Mr. Hyam? As it was written, you read it correctly. I did not include that in my oral testimony because after Ms. Hirota's um, testimony, I had a better understanding of what she was doing. I had trouble verifying the areas in the post-development plan. I, I don't have CAD, and so I'm doing this by hand. Uh, and I, I kept getting a discrepancy of 9.7 acres or thereabouts. Uh, but after I listened to her testimony, I just, I didn't want to confuse things any more than necessary. So I dropped that issue. And the only issue I carried forward was the coefficient for area D that's circled uh, in your, in the drawing that you have up. Right. Well, I, I believe uh, the, the, the issue of area D is still something you're pursuing. So. Yes. Could... Yes. Now I'll turn to figure 3.6 in the PER. Yes. Okay. And when you speak of area D, you're speaking of this area where I'm pointing to. Is that correct? Well, bigger than that. It's bigger than that. But well, it, it goes down to the blue line to the left and I believe to the road on the right. So yeah, well, wrap around, yeah, okay. all of that. Yeah, not quite way out there, but yeah. Okay, and your understanding is that this area is for the most part undisturbed, is that correct? It's, well, it's outside, most of it is outside the limits of grading, so I would assume it would be undisturbed. Is there some information that says otherwise? Well, the runoff coefficient is one indicator that this will not be undisturbed area. Um, and my understanding is that there will be grading done in this buffer area. So my question was, or is, why do you have an understanding that the area D and its surrounding areas within the buffer will be mostly undisturbed. How do you come to that conclusion? Because it's outside the limits of grading shown on this plan? I don't believe this diagram is showing the limits of grading by color, if that's what you're looking at. My understanding is that there will be grading and <coughs> the area will be disturbed in this buffer area. Okay. okay. In Let me ask you this question. Okay. Sir. Sure. Do you, do you understand what our buffer area is being used for or why, why the buffer area is being created? I think I understand why it's been created. I'm not sure where it's located. It's located in this area here where I'm pointing out in area D, area E6 and area C1. It's this, it's between this brown area or brownish reddish area and this dark red line, which outlines our petition area. 
So let me ask you what's happening in the buffer area? Well, let me back up and ask the question. Um, what is your understanding for the purpose of the buffer area? I did not look at the buffer area. I looked at this plan and assumed that the red contour shown on this plan showed the proposed grading and the black lines showed the existing grading. And that if I didn't see red contour lines, then that area wasn't being graded. And typically, if it's outside of the limits of grading, it's not to be cleared and grubbed. Now, if there's another plan that shows additional grading or additional clearing and grubbing beyond this, I did not have access to that. I, I, I can sympathize with you, Mr. Hyam. Um, it's, it's not easy uh, for, for people to read something like this, a map, you know. I can read this map fine. I can't anticipate a map I haven't seen. And I wish I had your ability, but I can represent to you that this is a buffer area, okay? This is, this is not the cemetery expansion area. And the reason why it is different from this area, which is the cemetery expansion area, is because the buffer area is an area where we are not allowed to have a cemetery use, okay? That is the purpose for the buffer area. It does not mean that there will be no grading. It does not mean that the land will be undisturbed. And I'm just wondering if you are aware of the purpose for the buffer area and its significance as a buffer. So it sounds like you're saying this buffer area is going to be cleared and grubbed and graded, but isn't included in the grading plan shown and may not be included in the volume shown. And I wonder if the homeowners realize that the cemetery folks are planning to clear and grub the hillside behind their houses. Is that, is that the plan? Well, if you could allow me to answer, ask the questions. I do have one that I believe will address what you just said or asked. Okay. Now, going back to your written testimony, okay, it says, if the additional 9.7 acres are corrected as undisturbed, it increases the post-development runoff volume. Did I read that correctly? When I wrote that, I was under the impression, well, I couldn't verify the areas. And I thought that, um, there was a, it was off by 9.7 acres. And if that change was made, it would actually increase the runoff. But as I said a minute ago, after Ms. Hirota's testimony, I just decided not to even try to sort that out because I couldn't point to a map and show where 9.7 acres was potentially off. Fair, so, that's fair. Uh, forget about the acreage the 9.7 acres, okay? Yeah. What I'm looking at this sentence for is this assertion that if the undisturbed area is corrected, meaning if it is increased, what it will do then is it increases the post-development runoff volume. Is that, is that your understanding? In other words, if we have more undisturbed area, do we have more runoff is what I'm asking. Is that true? Yes. And undis when you say undisturbed area, you're talking about the existing condition, correct? Yes. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the lower part of page three of your written testimony. Okay. In paragraph two of page three, where uh, the lower part of the page, you, you talk about the city standards, the city's 
rules relating to storm drain standards in plate six. Okay. And just, just to recap your testimony, plate six at 100 acres will give us 1,000 cubic feet per second, correct? Correct. And this is existing runoff, is that right? Correct. Thank you. Actually, I'm not sure it makes a difference. In place six doesn't differentiate between developed or undeveloped. Okay, we will get to that in a moment. Thank you. Now, when you compare our numbers, you refer to um, our EIS, which talks about uh, less than 200 CFS, correct? Correct. And that if, if we had seven more acres added to our drainage area, we would then be required to use plate six and, and come up with the 1000 CFS number. Is that right? That's correct. Now, let's take a look at the two methods that you brought up. And I'm showing you the written testimony of Jamie Hirota, our civil engineer. I'm looking at table one from Ms. Hirota's written testimony. Is this what you refer to as the rational method? Or a yes, she, she used the rational method to do her calculations. Thank you. <clears throat> now, table one compares the existing conditions with the proposed conditions. Um, and it gives a, basically a summary of the flow rates, the runoff rates, depending on the intensity of the rainfall event, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Now, I'm turning, I'm turning back to the PER, and this is table one, and I need to make it larger. If it won't, if this thing allow me to. Okay, so in the PER, in Appendix A, there are two tables. Table one is the pre-development hydrology. Is that correct? That is correct. And can you just, well, the rational method, would you agree that the rational method is based upon calculations the calculation being Q equals CIA. Is that? Do I have yes. That? Yes. So the table one in Ms. Hirota's written testimony is a summary showing the difference between the existing conditions and post development conditions. This table one in Appendix A of the PER only looks at the existing conditions. Is that correct? The pre-development, correct. That's correct. Okay. And in this, we have on table one that we're showing on that I'm showing on screen. We have A, B, C, D, and E for the for the um, drainage areas. Is that correct? That's correct. And then we have the areas, the area in acreage, C being the runoff coefficient, and this, because this is existing, it's all 0.35. And we have that C, and then we have the intensity, the rainfall event. Right. And then we get the numbers. Okay. And that's how we get the, that's how we get the volumes. The Q for the runoff rates and the V for the volumes. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And then with respect to post-development, we have table two, also in the PER. Did you have a chance to review this, sir? I did. Okay, thank you. It's and the one I had trouble verifying the areas too. 
I, you know, I, 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 again, I sympathize with you. I've, uh, I've gone over this, this, this graph many times and um, it was an educational experience, let me say that. So when we look at the areas here, we have, instead of A, B, C, D, we now have 25 different areas. And that's because of the various surface conditions that would exist if our project is approved. Is that your understanding? Yes. Okay. And then we have different areas, of course, in the acreage column and different coefficient numbers because we have the different surface areas. Could you give us a definition of runoff coefficient, your understanding, sir? I doubt it. I couldn't give you a definition. I th the way I think of it is that it's sort of like the percentage of runoff or the percentage of the rainfall that runs off. So the higher the number, the more of the rainfall runs off. So like in area C, 2, B is in boy, where it's 0.9, that represents a hard surface like a road or something hard, where virtually all the water runs off. 0.35 in some of the areas is the figure that Ms. Hirota used for undeveloped land. And 0.25, 0.25, was the factor she used for uh, developed area or grassed area. So her coefficient for grassed developed cemetery land said that only roughly 25% of the water would run off, where in the undeveloped condition, 30, 35% would run off. And where an area is a mixed between uh, developed and undeveloped, then you sort of take a, a average of the two figures depending on the prorated area that's one category or the, uh, the other. Did that answer your question? That's consistent with my understanding. And uh, it's also consistent with your written testimony, I believe, uh, where you say that where you have undisturbed area, you have more runoff, basically. Is that correct? Uh, that was Ms. Hirota's, that was from her report. Correct. And your written testimony also says that if we increase the undisturbed area, then we get more runoff. Isn't that, isn't that? Well, <clears throat> what I thought I was saying is that undeveloped area has more runoff than grassed cemetery land, according to the PER. And do you agree with that? I don't disagree with it. You do not disagree, correct? I do not disagree. Thank you. Okay, so this is how we calculate our post-development runoff. Um, Q equals CIA. <coughs> then we get the columns here, the volumes, well, the runoff rates and the volumes and they all get added up. And when the, the, the tallies at the bottom correlate to that summary in um, Ms. Hirota's written testimony, is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Now, and this is the rational method, correct? That is correct. Now, if we turn to the storm drainage standards, are you familiar with the storm drainage standards of the, of the city? I am familiar with them. And is this where we can find plate six? I hope so. Let's see if I can find it for us. Way at the back. There you go. Plate six. It's entitled Design Curves for Peak Discharge versus Drainage Area more than 100 acres. Is this the plate six that you speak of, sir? Yes, it is. And just to describe it for the, oh, for the record, this is um, petitioner's exhibit 65, the city's rules, drainage rules. And we are on page 
23 of the rules, PDF page number 28. Okay, so plate six comprise, is, is a graph with uh, on the horizontal axis, what we have is the acreage in hundreds of acres, correct? That's correct. So it starts at one, which is 100, correct? Correct. And on the vertical axis, we have the peak discharge in 100 CFS. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so if we have, if we start at 100 acres, we go up the vertical axis to, it intersects with, oh, I should back up. We have also three lines on the graph represented as group A, group B, and group C. Is that right? That is, that is right. And those three groups represent different areas of Oahu where group A is on the east side, group B is the central part of Oahu, and group C is on the west side, correct? Correct. And, and we, our project is located in group A. Is that right? That is right. So if we start at 100 acres, go up to group A, then we intersect the vertical axis at 1,000 CFS. Is that correct? That is correct. And that's the number. And you, you believe that this plate six is a more appropriate method than the rational method for our project? Yeah. Given the nature of the terrain, I do. Yes. Okay. And this calculates our existing runoff, correct? As I said, it doesn't differentiate between existing or developed. It's just what group are you in and how big an area and you get the runoff. It's, it's actually a much simpler method than the rational method. Right. It, it, it does appear to be much simpler. Let Mr. Tabata, if I may, I, can you give me a sense of how long your cross is going to go? Um, because we did accidentally end up with the engineering diagrams directly after lunch, as opposed to <laughs> the other witnesses. It's true. It's true. I, I think I have at least, I may have another, um, another 45 minutes or so. 45 minutes. Well, yeah. we are definitely taking a break and I'm <laughs> declaring that um, the anticipation that we would get through all the interveners witnesses by the end of the day also to be wildly optimistic. It is 2.06 p.m. I'd like to take a 10 minute recess, which will give us about 45 minutes. And then we have to actually break at three o'clock today. My intention will also be that for various reasons, I'm not sure that we're, I will say more about this later. I don't think it's gonna make sense to continue, continue this matter tomorrow, given the complexity of the issues arising, but we'll have to reschedule the closure of evidentiary hearings, hopefully for August 12th. Um, but right now, let's take a 10 minute break to 2.16. Thank you. So why don't you Um, it is 216.
Mr. Tabata, you were going to continue your torture of the commission, I mean, the questioning of the witness. <laughs> Mr. Hayo, just, just to recap briefly, the it is, it, is it your testimony that it is fair to use plate six to calculate the existing runoff as versus using the rational method? DPP, the Department of Planning and Permitting, would not require the use of plate six in this situation. Because this is a discretionary approval and the nature of the existing ground very steep, very rugged. I believe it's the more appropriate way to calculate the runoff. Okay. Would you agree that we are, we as a petitioner, we are required to calculate the post development runoff? You're required to calculate both pre development and post. Okay. How can we use plate six to calculate the post development runoff? You just walked us through it, a thousand cubic feet per second. Group A, 100 acres, straight up, thousand cubic feet per second. So, so there will be no change then in the runoff based on your use of plate six, is that correct? If there were no other changes, the fact of it being developed versus undeveloped, you're right. Using plate six, it would not change. In this case, well, you're, you're basically adding area A into the post development scenario, but since it's still less than 100 acres, it, that really wouldn't make a difference. So I think that's correct. So according to your testimony, our project will not increase the runoff then, correct? It, it no, is what, what I'm trying to say is that the rational method doesn't apply well, given the terrain of this site and that the plate six is a more appropriate way to, to calculate the runoff. And the runoff you get from plate six is about five times what you would get from the rational method. Okay. I'd like to turn back to the rules. Well, we are on the rules. And this is the, this is the drainage rules that we were discussing. And when you said that DPP would not require the use of plate six, okay, is it based is that based on what's stated on page one of the rules under paragraph B runoff quantity? Yes. Paragraph B one states. For drainage areas of 100 acres or less, the rational method shall be used. Did I read that correctly? You did, yes. So the use of the rational method for our project area, which is 93.2 acres, well, our, our drainage area, I'm sorry. The use of the rational method is mandatory, is that correct? I'm not saying that. I think DPP would be fine if you use the more conservative method uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the commission, because this is in a discretionary approval, will impose a higher standard than what DPP has in the drainage calculator, or the drainage standards. But there's no downside to DPP. If you guys decide to use the plate six, it's just everybody's safer that way. And for drainage areas greater than 100 acres, paragraph two that's when plate six would be used correct right 
you, you could ask DPP if they objected to using plate six for a 93 acre area, I suspect they would have no objections. Okay, so again, what you're saying is that we should be using plate six for both our existing and our post development runoff, correct? I'm saying it's a more appropriate method to calculate the runoff for this site. Yes. And you, you're also saying that we need to, or we should disregard the language of the rules which mandate the use of the rational method for our drainage area. Is that correct? I'm just suggesting you use a higher standard. even though that standard is contradictory to the mandatory I, language of the rules. I don't think it's contradictory. Nothing you design in the rational system or using the rational system would not be sufficient for the rational method. It, it, none of, nothing you would design would be undersized had you walked through the, you know, the same thing with a rational method. What you would typically find is all your pipes and, and inlets and everything would be larger than what the rational method would require. So where's the harm in that? I have no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Harn. That was a very fast 45 minutes. Yes. Okay. Um, county. The county has no question for this witness. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Office of Planning. Office of Planning has no questions. Thank you. Commissioners. Starting with, I believe, Commissioner Okuda. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hyam, for your testimony. Um, can I ask you this? Is it, your, is it your testimony or do you have an opinion looking at the bottom line here? Whether, is it your testimony that there is, that this project poses a foreseeable danger of flooding to the neighbors uh, downslope? Um, it, I believe that it has the potential to, and it's not the fault of the cemetery necessarily. It's just that three of three of the inlets are in the backyards of, of home lots of houses. Um, I, I think I went to all but one of the inlets and the one closest to the cemetery, um, the farthest to the left. I happened to talk to the homeowner there. And he said shortly after he moved in, uh, this is probably in the 60s, water was running down and, and the, the concrete line ditch going down to the inlet had some pipes sticking up to act as a debris barrier. And they did just what they were designed to do. They collected all the debris. But the runoff, runoff um, was coming so fast that the debris shot it up into the air and it went right over the inlet and landed in his backyard. Okay. So it doesn't take much to cause these basins to get clogged up and overflow. So there is a risk. Okay, is it your opinion that the grading that is proposed by Hawaiian Memorial Park alters in any way the existing drainage patterns? Yes. I can explain, but the short answer is yes. Yeah, and I, I think you already gave some of that explanation yeah. in your testimony. Uh, I just wanted that as a preliminary question. Uh, let me ask a follow-up question then. Is it your opinion that this alteration of the existing drainage flow of water, the alteration caused by or which would result from 
the proposed development of Hawaiian Memorial Park, that that alteration contributes or increases a foreseeable risk of flooding to the neighbors? Hmm. Um, I, I think there is uh, increased risk during construction. Uh, things are exposed and, and that would be an area of concern. That, that sub area A that we talked about isn't a huge area. Um, and if, if you don't count it in the pre-development runoff, what it basically does is say to me that the post-development runoff is gonna be about the same as the uh, pre-development runoff. The one, the one saving grace to me for the cemetery is the detention basins they're proposing because that has the ability to slow down uh, the runoff uh, and hopefully protect the inlets from debris and possibly make things better. But 12,000 cubic feet, in my mind, isn't really enough to move the needle a lot. Hey, well, my question is really a more bottom line question. Okay. It, it's whether or not after the development has been finished and completed, whether or not the alteration of the present existing drainage pattern, whether that alteration increases the foreseeable risk of flooding to the neighbors. Well, I, I guess I would answer it this way. Uh, right now, the site is heavily forested, lots of roots and branches and trees. All of that's gonna tend to slow the runoff down. And, and the slower things are, the better, because when water gets velocity, that's where it can do great damage. Once the cemetery, if, if that's approved and it's developed, if the uh, debris barriers were ever overwhelmed, if there was a rock slide that crushed the chain link fence and, and that stuff came onto the cemetery property, there's literally nothing to slow it down. The cemetery's 20 to 30% slope. So if it's raining hard in the middle of the night, a bunch of rocks hit that fence and crush it, and things start rolling down the cemetery, it's gonna hit one, of, one or more of those uh, inlets. And, and if it's the three, any of the three behind the houses, then there is a risk of flooding those adjacent homes. Okay, well, just to, to sum up, can, can you, are you, is it yes, the alteration of the, uh, the ex currently existing drainage patterns will increase a foreseeable risk of flooding? No, it won't, or you really don't know and you don't have an opinion at this point in time? I can say yes, it may uh, all, uh, have an adverse impact. Okay. My final question is this, even though a drainage plan has been proposed uh, or submitted by the applicant as part of this uh, boundary amendment application. Is it true or not true that DPP or some other city agency will pass on the sufficiency uh, of the drainage plan, the ultimate drainage plan? I believe that DPP would look at this and say it meets their standards. And the residents are not involved in the in the review of the grading plan, or they're not part of that process. So once the Land Use Commission uh, rules in favor, then the homeowners have no chance of uh, being part of making this better for them, keeping it from being a bigger problem. So but I, it I is, guess- Yeah, I understand, but it, but it is true that uh, DPP, um, supposedly using the expertise that they have, including engineering expertise, will evaluate whatever plan that the uh, landowner proposes, assuming that the landowner gets past uh, at least this approval by the Land Use Commission. Is that correct? I believe that is correct. 
So what's being proposed to us right now may not be the final uh, plan which uh, is submitted and approved by DPP. Would that be a fair statement? Well, I hope it wouldn't be, but I think that's largely up to you folks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hyam. I have no further questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner Okuda. Commissioners, um, Commissioner Chang. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Hyam, I probably have learned more than I needed to learn about <laughs> and drainage. Um, I'm sorry you, about that. Yeah, no, no, not at all. I mean, you, you, did, you did get my attention. Um, and I am curious now, given the cross-examination, um, if you were to use plate six rather than the rational basis, what, in your opinion, what would be the difference? Well, in, in this case, um, maybe not that much. The, uh, usually the rational methods used are like for subdivisions where they're gonna put in roads and houses and dedicate the roads to the city. And if you follow the rational method and design the pipes accordingly, the city will accept your drainage system. In this case, all the roads are gonna be private. So they can, they don't, they don't have to worry about the city accepting it. The, the difficulty I have trying to answer that question is that the, the water quality requirements are somewhat independent of the amount of runoff. I think I, if I'm right, you provide for a, a volume of one inch um, of rainfall over the area and there's a, a couple of factors that get multiplied in there. I forget the formula, but whether you follow the rational method or the plate six method, the water quality uh, basins, if you will, the detention basins follow a slightly different rule that are somewhat independent. At least that's my understanding, which is why in my testimony, I made it a point of making, making an issue of the volume in the basins. That's, to me, the critical thing to protect the homeowners is to make detention retention basins as big as possible to afford them the most protection. So that leads me to my next question. If you were designing in light of what you've seen, their, their proposed plan. If you were designing it to provide the homeowners greater protection, what would you do differently? Well, primarily I would try to move the two large detention basins into the gullies. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and that's not as easy as it, as it sounds mm -hmm. because yeah it will take away some of their usable land. So um, although it will, will reduce their costs by reducing excavation, it reduces some of their revenue by reducing the land that they have to, to sell plots. Um, but I would look at locate, relocating those two basins and trying to make them as big as possible. The, the one area, um, that is actually area D uh, is the only one that wouldn't have a detention basin upstream of the inlet. And when I looked at their grading plan, it looked like they were actually trying to take some of the runoff that currently goes down area D and shift it over into area C, which I thought made a lot of sense because the area C had a detention basin to protect that inlet. Um, but that, you, you know, if all these inlets were at roads, where the, if the water just jumped the inlet, it would run down the road, it, it wouldn't be as big an issue. But mm -hmm. three of them in the backyards, I mean, that's, that's yeah. a concern. That seemed, based upon your testimony, that seems to be your major concern, is that three of the outlets are in the backyard of, of the residents. Yes. Um, if they were relocated to another location, um, you would feel much more comfortable with what they're proposing. Well, you may not be able to relocate the inlets or the existing ones, but put detention basins 
um, as big as possible upstream of them to catch all the debris um, and, and mitigate the, the peak flows to some extent. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate sure. your testimony. Very enlightening. Thank you, Commissioner Chang. Is there anything further, commissioners? Commissioners? If I may, Mr. Hyam, briefly. Um, I understand, I believe, the main thrust of your testimony, which is that especially if you happen to have rainfall heavily centered over this one area, these calculations would not be adequate to protect the downstream neighbors, particularly um, during the construction period. Is that essentially the main thrust of your testimony? Yes, yes okay. it is. Yeah, and I, I like, I spent New Year's Eve 1987 in the Kaiser High School auditorium because of the New Year's Eve flood um, when New Valley looked like a raging river. Um, so so I, 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 I get the intensity of rainfall that can happen in Hawaii. What I'm trying to understand is, is it reasonably calculable in any meaningful way, the chance that this might occur? Well, um, I, I, none that I can think of. I, I happen to be in charge of the Hawaii Kai Marina in that 80, late 80 storm. And in one night, we had mud and rocks rolling down Kaalake Valley, the first valley in Hawaii Kai. Yeah. It filled up an entire waterway. Uh, people could walk from one side to the other. I mean, I wouldn't have thought that possible uh, in one night, New Year's Eve of all yeah. nights. Yeah, I, with 13 uh, inches but, of rain in nine hours was, I yeah. believe, what it and, what happened. And, and most of that stuff, the, the Kaheka Street in Haori Valley, oh, that central drain channel was designed using plate six. It was a big channel, but there was blockage at the top where the boulder basin was water couldn't get into the channel and it went down the street and it literally just ripped the street right out and and because it was it was steep it was fast moving and that's where it gets dangerous okay thank you very much for your responses is there anything sure. further commissioners if not is there any redirect oh commissioner cabral yes thank you very much um and I think you've answered some of these, but I get, I get confused because it, it, with the different information and the different questions, it seems to sometimes redirect in my brain as to what, whether my answer's been, my question's been answered or not. So did you say that the statistical information that all of these studies are being based on is really the island wide? So I think at one point you had A, B, and C maps, and there's like an average of that. So they're taking that as how much rainfall that is going to happen at any given time, and that's been how they calculated it. Or you went back and forth a couple of times, and I wasn't sure where we ended up on that question. Yeah. That, that graph that you're referring to, I think, is the plate six uh, graph. That's the, the 100 acre and more graph. In the rational method, uh, there are graphs that show the projected rainfall for the island. I, and I don't think we punched any of them up, so you didn't see them on the screen. But there are graphs for a 10 year storm and a 20 year storm, a 100 year storm. And they have uh, Con contours around the, uh, the island. So, you know, all the shoreline area is like two inches per, per hour. And then as you go up on a hill, it goes to three inches or four inches, and, you know, farther up. But those, those are the contours that act like the, the storm hits the entire island evenly. It's mm -hmm. raining everywhere. In that late 80 storm in Hawaii Kai, um, that did all that damage. At that time, I lived in town in a, a condo. It wasn't raining in town, but it was flooding in Hawaii Kai in East mm -hmm. Honolulu. So there's a storm that didn't hit the entire island like the rational method anticipates, 
It just hit East Honolulu. Okay. Thank you. That's what I had understood. And then, um, again, some of the primary concern you've expressed is what's going to happen during the construction time, correct? As opposed to after the construction, you have referenced some of that too, because of, of course, the unknown rain, rain yeah. factor and rain time, yeah. But is most of what you were analyzing was pro during construction? It, that's the biggest concern by far. And the hundred, um, it's, it's really hard to get a feel for this, but the hundred cubic feet per second, when you equate that, if when you do the math and turn it into gallons per minute, that's like almost 50,000 gallons a minute. So the runoff at 110 CFS cubic feet per second is equal to about 50,000 gallons a minute. So the runoff from that entire site is filling up a large swimming pool every minute. Yeah. I mean, a large swimming pool is 30 or 40,000 gallons. So every minute or two, that's how much water is coming. So you can't hope to detain all that water on site during construction. You can put sediment basins and silt screens and things, and you can try to trap the silt, but there's typically so much water that you just, you can't slow it. You, you can slow it down a little, but it's leaving the site and usually with a lot of runoff, with a lot of sediment. Okay, if you do construction and you, and I I'm, don't know what the plans are in terms of timing, but if you were to have the construction happen over um, a variegated time period, so at no one time is the entire runoff slope of an area under construction at the same time, is that something that would help to possibly mitigate these problems? It, it will, and the city does have fairly strict uh, grading uh, guidelines. They're not supposed to open up more than, uh, I think it's 15 acres uh, in any one area. Uh, when you have a site like this that has 470,000 yards of excavation and nearly that much in fill, what you're, you're doing really is you're excavating in one area and then taking that over and filling another area. So it's, it's you, you're, you're gonna end up opening up a lot of areas. They may not be all connected, um, but you're gonna have probably more than 15 acres open at any one time in order to do it in 12 to 16 months. That's, that's a lot of dirt to move. And it's not just dirt. They're, they're cutting 100 feet, so it's going to be into rock. Uh -huh. It's going to be some hard excavation in, in some areas. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I live in Hilo and Waikauk, and I understand Waikauk means upper white water. <laughs> I've had potholes in the county roadway roads in front of my house. One, my Yukon truck car could have dropped inside of him and buried flat. That's a pothole for you. So I've lived around some white water. So thank you. It, it is a concern. Sure. Thank you very much for your good information. Thank you. Commissioner Ohigashi. I want to thank Mr. Higgins. He came across as intelligent and he made some good points. And I, and However, also I, I enjoyed his testimony and I just wanted to tell you that. I also thank enjoyed you. I also enjoyed Curtis Tabatas, uh, and unlike the chairman, I was not bored, but I was watching every single um, part of it. I just want to thank you, though. Thank you. The chair will note he watched every single part of the testimony and was not bored, but I was tortured. Um, so, in any case, is there any redirect, Mr. Yoshimori? There is no redirect. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Haya. Okay, thank You're you welcome. very much. It is 2.46 p.m. I'm guessing that um, Mr. Ewan appears to be here, but I'm not thinking that his testimony is brief enough to handle both his direct and any cross prior to three o'clock. Now, I'd, I'd like to ask if we can move up um, Mr. Middleton. I think his testimony is relatively short and he is unavailable on the proposed August date. So we'd, we'd really like to try and get to him today. 
but we have to be, we actually have a hard stop at three o'clock, okay? So um, if, if this is the case, let's do it. Um, Ken, Ken Middleton, is that correct? Yes. There's two Ken Middletons in the waiting room. I'll do one, see if that works. Mr. Middleton, can you hear us and see us? Mr. Middleton, either connection. Mr. Ishimori? Uh, uh, we're, we're checking. Okay, here we go. There I am. Okay. Aloha. Aloha. Um, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give us the truth? Yes, I do. Okay, please proceed, Mr. Yoshimori. Thank you. Um, for the record, Mr. Middleton's resume is Intervenors Exhibit 9, and his written testimony is Intervenors Testimony Number 3. Um, and so thank you very much, Mr. Middleton, for testifying today. Can you please state your name and address for the record? Uh, sure. It's uh, Ken Middleton, uh, reside at 796 Kalani Kulu Street in uh, Hawaii Kai 96825. Uh, can you please describe your occupation? Uh, yeah, I'm self-employed. I've operated trademark charters for the last uh, almost 35 years. Uh, and uh, we have a number of charter vessels that we provide recreational services and, along with ash scatterings out of Kiwelo Harbor. Okay. Um, I'd like to submit Mr. Middleton as an expert on ash scatterings. Uh, petitioner? No objection. That's City? Uh, no objections. No objections. Commissioners? Yeah, this is Commissioner Wong. Yes. No objection, but if you could ask um, Mr. Middleton to speak a little bit louder, it was very hard to hear him at the end. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is this better? Yes. Okay. So you're so admitted as an expert. Please continue, Mr. Yoshimori. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Middleton, Mr. Middleton, sorry. Can you please review the key reasons people give for doing um, at sea ash scatterings? Uh, certainly, yeah. I mean, uh, the the deceased often requests that in their you know estate planning or their will. Uh, lots of different reasons. Uh, you know, they were possibly watermen or waterwomen that had a favorite surf break uh, or fishermen, or they just enjoyed the, the marine environment and the, the marine life that we have offshore. Uh, we have a lot of uh, out of towners that uh, fly home. Maybe they grew up here and went to the mainland and uh, they wanna you know, come home as they, their life winds down and, uh, and be released upon the ocean. Do they also mention affordability and environmental factors? Um, yeah, to some degree. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I, I've got experience myself personally on the uh, on the, the cost differences between us and, and some of the uh, uh, facilities here on the island. But uh, yeah, they, they like our pricing. We try to keep it uh, affordable for everybody. Um, and I think, yeah, I think a lot of folks, you know, are environmentally conscious and realize that we have absolutely no impact upon the environment. Uh, it's very clean um, process that we release some, one's ashes out at sea. Um, you, you mentioned the prices. Um, would you mind sharing um, what, how your prices compare to traditional burials? Well, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, traditional burials. Uh, my my uh, wife's uh, grandparents, we, uh, they both passed within a few months of each other about 10 years ago, and they'd already owned plots actually at Hawaii Memorial Park. And uh, all in with the, you know, the cremation and the, you know, all the, all the procedures and everything that, that's involved in doing it traditionally. It was about $10,000 a piece. 
what shocked me, um, we have packages that start at $500 out of Kiwala Harbor uh, for a simple uh, cruise with the family present. Um, in your written testimony, you said that you've performed over 600 ash scatterings in 2019. Is that correct? That's correct. And Hawaiian Memorial had commissioned a study by CDRE saying that uh, in 2019, ash scattering numbers were estimated to be 1,074. Um, your written testimony says that that number is low. C can you explain why you think that it's low? Well, just last year, for instance, we did about uh, 450 for local, or excuse me, for uh, um, yeah, 450 for uh, for local families. So I, you know, I'm I'm sure we're not doing half of the ash scatterings that are uh, being conducted here on Oahu. So I'm guessing I don't have any numbers on that, but you know, it'd be simple to tally up the number of cremations that occur on the island. Uh, the same study assumes that ash scatterings will remain at 18% of cremations. Do you, do you think that's correct? Uh, I'm not a statistician, but yeah, I'm guessing that's probably low. It's definitely a growing trend. We've been uh, conducting ash scatterings for most of those 35 years I've been in business. And, and particularly the last maybe 12, 15 years since I built a site just devoted to that, it's been growing probably by 10% year over year. So it's definitely a growing trend, you know, more, uh, uh, you know, like uh, the Catholics have embraced that as a, a suitable disposition of ashes. Uh, they did that a number of years ago. So um, yeah, it's being embraced by many, many folks around the world and, and many faiths around the world. That's great. And, and you also testified that you can accommodate Excuse me, go ahead. So, Mr. Yoshimori, we have seven minutes left. You've indicated Mr. Middleton's not available on August 12th. Um, I, I do, for the fairness of the parties, want to make sure that there's a chance for any cross. Otherwise, we run into a procedural issue. I just have one last question. Uh, go ahead. So, so, so can, uh, you had testified that you can accommodate more, is that correct? More, oh, more right. SC burials. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Middleton, for volunteering your time and your testimony. And Mr. Middleton is available for questions. Okay, Mr. Tabata. Thank you. Mr. Middleton, would you agree that people should have a choice on how the remains are treated? Oh, of course. And your testimony here today um, with respect to the scattering of ashes, do you, do you necessarily oppose Hawaii Memorial Cemetery expansion project? I don't really have an opinion on it uh, one way or another. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a party to it um, as far as impact. Uh, I'm not familiar with all the circumstances. I've tuned in three or four times to testify and I just catch a little bit of testimony each time waiting for my opportunity to share my knowledge about ash scatterings. I don't, I don't have an opinion on Hawaii Memorial Park. Thank you. I have no more questions. Thank you. City? Uh, the city has no questions for this witness. Thank you. Planning? He has no questions. Commissioners? Any redirect, Mr. Yoshimori? I have no redirect. And, uh, Thank you again, Mr. Middleton. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Middleton. Um, okay, it's 2.55, we are losing a commissioner at three. As I indicated before, given the complexity of the issues, the desire of all parties to have a full opportunity to thoroughly question all witnesses, um, I think it's in our best interest to not continue this matter to tomorrow, as is our possibility on the agenda, but rather to try and devote August 12th to this matter and hopefully close the evidentiary proceedings on this matter. Is that acceptable to the parties? For the city, yes. Mr. Tabata. That is acceptable for petitioner. Yes, that's acceptable to OP. Okay. And Mr. Yoshimori, it sounds like you checked with your witnesses and, and Mr. Middleton was the one who was not available. 
Uh, actually, he's the only one I checked with, but we have no oh, objections. Okay. 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 Great. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we're going to go into recess until 9 a.m. tomorrow via is, Zoom. Is, oh, Commissioner Axel. Do you have any idea for tomorrow till what time we're convening? Uh, we are convening at 9 a.m. and we will go till 3, 3 p.m. again when we have a hard stop as well. So the next yeah, item on our agenda will be um, item five. Great, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions, commissioners? If not, um, gratitude to the parties and the witnesses for today and we are in recess. <laughs>